Good evening and welcome to our Board of Commissioner meeting for September 22nd. We have several committee meetings uh, this evening. We're going to juggle the batting order a little bit. Uh, we'll start off with finance and we have public works, grant and community development and what, as well as uh, building and planning this evening. So we will not waste any time. We will get right to it and uh, recognize items on tonight's finance committee agenda. The first is for the committee to consider awarding a contract for bridge culvert and cord repair. Uh, and to tell us more, I'll call on uh, Eric Traub, our chief financial officer. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Zella. Um, so this is a extensive bid. If you look at the bid tab with multiple ad alternates, you also have in your materials a memo from our township engineer, which I would call your attention to. That includes the recommendation um, of the engineer, which the director of public works and myself are um, in alignment with the calls for uh, the base bid plus two of the ad alternates and then the contingency item. Um, with this, uh, the bid is roughly 5% over the estimate. However, hopefully those contingencies are not um, used to the full extent and that way we'll stay on budget or below budget. Um, but to, in general, uh, given the number of bids and, and where they came in, I feel comfortable moving forward. Uh, okay, thank you, Eric. This is for four bridges, one culvert, all of which are owned by the township. For those watching, this does not include the currently closed bridge on Mill Creek Road, uh, which is owned by Montgomery County. And that bridge and its need to be reconstructed is a Montgomery County project that we are uh, uh, staff and public works and our manager are working hard to advance. Uh, these four bridges and culvert are coming from two different sources in our capital improvement plan budget. Uh, and as Eric said, the total is 5% more than estimated. Do any committee members have any questions or comments? Seeing none, do any members of the public have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll move that this committee recommend to the Board of Commissioners the approval uh, of awarding a contract for bridge, culvert, and cord repair to Professional Construction Contractors, Inc. Uh, in accordance with the bids received on Thursday, August 19th, 2021 at 11 a.m. And the recommendation of the Chief Financial Officer with approval of the Director of Public Works and Township Engineer uh, in the amount of $327,250. Do I have a second? Seconded by Commissioner McComb. All those in favor, uh, indicate by raising your hand. Any opposed? Uh, Madam Secretary, the motion carries unanimously. All right, next uh, item on the Finance Committee agenda tonight is for the committee to consider awarding a contract for the hauling and disposal, uh, haul, I should say hauling and disposal disposal services from the Lower Marion Transfer Station. Eric, uh, do you want to explain this to us? Yeah, so this is a contract in terms of where does our trash go? Um, once the uh, the refuse crew is taken away from your house, it goes to the cable complex, to the transfer station, um, and then there is a vendor who then takes it away. So uh, basically, the uh, township has had an existing contract with the uh, Covanta uh, entity. That contract started in 2015, went through 2018, was extended twice in, uh, for 2020 and 2021. Um, you know, in talking with the board it, in last previous years, uh, there was also a desire to, um, to bid this out and to have a comparison also between the waste to energy uh, structure that we've had with Covanta for several years with potentially landfill and look at that also from an environmental perspective. Um, so from what we have for the bids, uh, we basically have two bids, one that's waste energy with the current vendor Covanta, which is the low bid, and one with landfill. And the landfill bid, as you can see in the bid tabulation, is significantly um, more expensive uh, for the township. Um, waste to energy, obviously, um, with the bid tab financially more advantageous. And also, as you look through your issue briefing, 
um, appears to be also the better choice from an environmental and sustainability perspective for the township. Uh, this bid uh, at coming in for 2022 at a little over $88 a ton is a significant increase from our current contract um, that might have to just do with where the markets are right now in terms of, if you think about the pandemic and increasing tonnages and things of that nature, um, it might be certainly a, a factor in terms of where the bid came in. Um, you have various background materials before you on this. This is a multi-year contract. Um, all we are deciding right now is uh, whether or not to move forward with the base contract. We don't have to make any uh, commitments, obviously, out into the extension years. Um, but in terms of the recommendation, it is the staff recommendation that we move forward with this contract at this point. Um, you have various materials before you in terms of the, uh, the background information, in terms of the environmental aspects of it. Our sustainability manager is here tonight and can answer any questions you might have on that. In terms of overall costs, um, it will increase the overall cost to the uh, solid waste fund next year uh, versus this year, all tonnages being equal, which tonnages will never be equal, but in a round figure around a quarter million dollars. Um, so obviously that means um, you know a little bit more stress overall moving forward to the solid waste fund. And hopefully there will be some ways that we can counteract that. We'll talk about that through the solid waste forecast and, and obviously um, some of the other uh, issues uh, around solid waste hauling and ways to reduce waste and things of that nature. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions and our sustainability manager would as well. Thank you, Eric. Uh, in the base contract that's uh, proposed for uh, our consideration tonight is a five year contract with pricing that is. Uh, uh, Distinct for each of those five years. Yes. Yeah, so so we're not, it's not a vote on 22 pricing, it's a vote on pricing for 2022 through 2026. That's correct. So, approximately a 3% increase per year. Our previous contract with Levanta had approximately 2% increase per year. Thank you very much. Do any committee members have any questions or comments for either uh, Eric or for Paloma Villa, who is here, who is our new sustainability manager? and who wrote a, uh, a very detailed memo that was included in our packet on the uh, environmental differences between the environmental impacts and differences between uh, disposal in a WTE, which is a waste to energy, uh, which is what the, the Covanta plant uh, uh, near Norristown is, and the, um, and the landfill, which is in Birdsboro, which is some 44 miles away. Committee members with questions or comments. Vice President Garrett. Thank you, uh, Chairman Zellow. Um, Eric, uh, just a question. Rates are obviously very high right now. You mentioned because of, potentially because of the pandemic. Um, why would we move forward with a five-year contract if we've been doing one-year contracts, you know, shorter contracts? Is now a good time to do such a long-term contract? Well, we've been doing extensions because we were at the tail end of an existing long-term contract okay. where we had that option. Uh, we had a mutual option with Covanta in terms of extending it. So we're basically at a point where you have to do a contract. Now, if the board said, you know, we really don't like these rates, we want to, you know, turn this down, and we want to rebid it, and we only want to do two years, that could be an option. But I would also say, I think, at a two year, you might have higher rates, especially when you look at this, we had two bids and there's quite a spread between the two bids. These same two bidders come back. I found that low bidder, where's my bid gonna go? No doubt, and, and that was and, my- yeah. So I, I, I think the board is, you know, we're in a little bit of a tough position uh, in terms of, you know, I think we ended up, if you look in retrospect, we were in a very good position when we bid this, and this was before my time in 2014. We actually had, I think, like a $2 a ton, so maybe $3 a ton decrease in the first year of that contract. I think we benefited at mm -hmm. that point in time from this. And I think, you know, we're just in a little bit more of a difficult pickle this time. No, absolutely. And I understand that. And that's why, to me, doing a five-year contract versus a three or even a four-year contract at this point when things are at a peak. I don't know, you know, I'm obviously we're relying on your expertise and saying, hey, the risk 
the risk reward might not be there. Yeah. And, and honestly, obviously I, I'm not someone who understands and knows and has at my disposal where our current trash hauling price is right now. It's not something that is bid very frequently and something, you know, that, you know, I do know where we were with our, um, you know, extensions were a, a pretty reasonable rate at that time. But I think the onset of the pandemic has kind of thrown anything that was done pre-pandemic potentially out the window. Um, you know, from a, you know, a potential future perspective, maybe a contract such as this, maybe we would revise it and we'd have to talk to the solicitor and things of that nature. I'm not sure if we can do something where you have three years and then a break and then two years and then extensions or something else of that nature. Again, even if you were to do something like that, you know, your bidders are going to respond then in different ways to that. If they don't have the certainty of an extended period of time, obviously anyone who's consulting or legal or whatever, if you have a potential, you know, contract you're going to have for a four-year period of time versus two-year period of time, you price those things differently. So, um, you know, we might not still, even if we were to do something different, we might be looking at higher prices versus current. It's all a little bit of guesswork, but I do understand the uh, the concern about the the uh, significant increase. So, in terms of process, we if we wanted to say, hey, let's try to negotiate for instead of five years, doing it three years with two one year options or something like that. That's a whole new bid. We can't yeah, do that. Yeah, there's, no, in our there's no negotiating. Gotcha. There is. This is low bid per the bid specs. You either accept or reject a new bid. Got it. Those are your options. Okay. Thank you. Um, I also did have a question for our sustainability manager as well. Is it brief? Um, hi, Paloma. Thank you for joining us. Um, we emailed a little bit back and forth. Um, obviously, with the rates going so high, there, you know, the more. Uh, waste we dispose of, the more we're going to pay for a township. Our, our CFO talked about, you know, an extra quarter of a million dollars potentially if the waste stays the same. Are there opportunities in your mind to reduce the amount of waste that, you know, that this township is, is generating? Uh, yes, I think uh, not only are there opportunities, but I think that is something that if environmental impact and financial impact is important to us, something that we should be exploring. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously, there's there's a huge environmental impact, and I think we're seeing a big financial push on it as well. So, you know, I think it does make sense for us as a as a township to look at ways to increase recycling, encourage people to reduce trash, you know, look at our businesses, things like that, composting. Um, so, if, if those are things that you have in your kind of remit, would be wonderful. Great, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Gavrin. Are there uh, any other committee members with questions or comments? Are there any online? Are there any members of the public who have any uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, I will observe that the um, price increase uh, from the last contract with Covana is 22%. Uh, so it's a very big price increase, but me, we have no choice uh, because the premium for the landfill is 43%, which is extraordinary. So I will uh, move that this committee recommended the Board of Commissioners the approval of an award to uh, for a contract for hauling and disposal services from the Lower Marion Transfer Station to Covanta Sustainable Solutions, LLC, in accordance with the bids received on Tuesday, September 14th, 2021 at 11 a.m. and the recommendation of the Chief Financial Officer with the approval of the Director of Public Works. Pricing in 2022 at 88.13 per ton, 2023 of 90.77 per ton, 2024 at 93.50 per ton, 2025 at 96.30 per ton, 2026 at 99.19 per ton. Do I have a second? Uh, Commissioner O'Neill, uh, seconds. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, please so indicate. Uh, I see one opposed. Uh, any abstentions? Uh, Madam Secretary, I believe that this passes 13 to 1. 
12 to, 12 to 1. We have 13 commissioners with us tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice President Gavron, would you be willing to allow this item to be on consent next Wednesday? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Commissioner Uzelov, um, yes, I, and it may, President it may indeed go on consent. We have one person who's not here who may want to make a comment one way or the other. We'll just make that available to Commissioner Courtney, but I assume that he would approve this as well. So I just want to give him that option. I know he's had a, a couple of emails out from this. So are you asking that it not go on consent? Yeah, well, not at this point. We may make that a late time consent. But I just want to give Commissioner Courtney the opportunity for something he wishes to do. To comment on it is the consent is contingent uh decision to be made by friday at noon <laughs> actually if yeah, i could have right. that decision tomorrow because i'm off yeah. on friday right. so i gotta uh, nail down yeah. the agenda by well, the end I'll, of tomorrow i'll, I'll tell you what <laughs> i'll you. tell you what let, let's do this we'll place it on consent if we need to pull it off we can pull it yep. off. Very we good. That off thank you very good thank you uh let's go to item number three on the finance committee agenda this is uh a presentation uh and for information only uh this is on the Solid Waste Fund financial forecast directly related to uh, the second item, the item that we just discussed, which is the uh, uh, hauling and disposal services that we just approved from Covanta. Uh, and so to present his forecast, I'll again call on Eric Proud, our chief financial officer. All right, thank you. So uh, every September we, we take a look at the Solid Waste Fund, which is an enterprise fund. In terms of we're gonna look at uh, the fund overall, history, financial performance, and then we'll talk about what things look like for next year and overall fees and such. Um, so an enterprise fund, that basically means the user fees that everyone pays um, in terms of trash service and in terms of some of the, the other kind of charges for services in this fund are set for full cost recovery. Um, our policy is around a 10% fund balance level. Um, we haven't always hit that. Um, in terms of the control that we have over the fund, it's not a great concern to me. It's never something that's been brought up as a concern from a, a financial risk perspective. Um, in terms of, you know, overall, there's just some stats here in terms of overall tonnage, uh, recycling and, and commingled that did actually update those numbers. And some of those obviously have been growing, um, especially the, the paper in light of the uh, ongoing pandemic. So when you look at the solid waste fund fee history, you know, there's, there's basically been fee increases generally roughly every other to every third year going back about the last decade. Generally, from the board's perspective, from at least my history here, generally what we try to do is avoid having fee increases in fast cash as well. Um, you know, that's something um, that generally has been kind of a prerogative of the board. And in 2021, um, obviously, we had uh, discussions a lot at the end of 2020 about the solid waste fee structure that was restructured. You kind of see that um, in the bottom chart here on the bottom table in terms of the, uh, the consolidation of the brackets. And also, um, you know, when we talk about lessening overall waste in terms of that nature, basically really putting a cap in terms of, of overall waste on a, on a weekly basis. So um, this lets you kind of see where people are subscribed at various rates. So, um, you know, the vast majority are at the, the standard level, which isn't to be unexpected. It's consistent with kind of past and things of that nature. Um, you know, generally what we saw is these numbers, uh, when we actually sent out the tax bills, they were a little bit different. There were a few more mini cans, a, a few less enhanced, but that generally happens is like people uh, when they pick a subscription, just pick the lowest one. They don't, maybe some of them don't quite understand or, you know, someone who's always used three cans is trying to go down to use only two, but they basically figure out they can't and they end up kind of re, uh, getting reassigned to higher levels. So overall, uh, these are in line with um, what we expected and generally have followed the, the general trends we see throughout the years. In terms of speaking of those trends, we have seen a trend uh, which, you know, from a trash volume perspective is positive in terms of people transitioning to reduce subscription levels. We've also seen rear yard subscriptions uh, fall consistently on an annual basis. So you, you see the stats here in terms of more mini can users, more standard and then less enhanced, less rear yard. Um, you know, as a point of reference, rear yard was about 23% of the population had rear yard in 2011. It's now about 18%. 
Um, and every single year we've seen that drop down. And I anticipate that's going to continue until there's, you know, there's some level of people just because of size of the proper property, topography in terms of we have a lot of, um, you know, very long driveways that might lead up to develops, you know, that people will always need to have rear yard. Um, but it's probably something that is going to continue to drop um, slowly as, as we move forward. And, and again, from a, you know, a volume of waste perspective, um, people moving to smaller subscriptions is good, um, but it does have a restriction on our overall revenue. So, um, you know, there, there's this kind of push pull. We want people to reduce waste because we don't want to have to pay as much to dispose. But if they're reducing waste and also reducing their subscription level, that does have a financial impact on the fund. Um, and that can cause pressure on the, on the fund and on rates overall. Absent you know, fee increases, we haven't seen a lot of growth in the solid waste fund, with one exception, which I'll, we'll talk to in a second. Overall, our charges for services in terms of people maybe bringing trash or recycling leaves, things of that nature into the transfer station, has really, it's really still pretty much down from those pre-pandemic levels. Um, you know, we used to generate a decent amount of, of interest income with interest rates basically plummeting down to rock bottom levels. That's been constrained. Uh, our recycling grant revenues we've gotten from PADDP, when you look over a long term, they've been declining as well. Um, you know, recycled paper, though, all, everyone in all their Amazon boxes and Target boxes they have out, that's actually been extremely volatile, but been a bright spot recently. You just look at this history. It started up here, has palmed, and it's it's gone back up. Um, and I actually just got notice from our our, uh, our refuse division supervisor this week uh, that the price in August is actually up to one hundred and twenty three dollars a ton for paper. That's the highest rate I have seen in any of our records that we have. Which I think it's, at least goes back six seven years that I've seen. Um, so that's something. As when we get into the financials, we'll talk about has been something that's very helpful to the township uh, in, in terms of its solid waste fund. Um, in terms of the expenses, you, your expenses, basically 97% of it boils down to, you know, these five categories you see on the disposal, the people and their benefits, the, the hauling in terms of commingled, which is another thing we'll talk about, which has actually been very positive from a commodity perspective for the township in the last 12 months or so. Um, the equipment fund rates, which again is about replacing the trash trucks, recycling trucks over time, and the transfer to the general fund for the indirect cost, because as an enterprise fund, it needs to pay all its costs. So as a operation, it's not like refuse has its own finance department or IT department or HR, but they pay a fee essentially back to the general fund for all those centralized services which they make use of. Um, so those are really the, the everything else is, is really a, a drop in the trash. Um, when you look at overall tonnage, and this gets back to some of the comments our sustainability manager was making, when you look at the trends, let's see if, I'm not sure if you actually see, I think you do see the cursor on here. So the blue line here is the actual um, refuse disposal costs and thousands of dollars. The red bars are the actual volumes, numbers of tons of trash. So what you really see is over a, a 10 year plus period, you, you really do see, obviously there's ebbs and flows, but you see a downward trend in overall refuse volume. And then what you see is you see the pandemic. Um, you see that in 2020, it's, it remains um, somewhat elevated in 2021. Uh, we'll have to see if the return to normalcy hopefully does come about if hopefully we can continue to drive those numbers down. Um, this chart I'm going to explain for a few minutes. It, it, I know it kind of looks like an EKG, but I think it's important to have all the information on here. So what this really gets to is this point about commodity markets and their changes. So what you have here is three different lines. Your red line and your blue line are based on the left-hand axis here. So your red line is your trash per ton cost, and the blue line is your per ton cost for homing. So that's all your plastics, your glass, things of that nature. So what you see on here is there's been times since 2014 right here, if the blue line is above the red line, you're basically paying more to recycle than you would be if that would all go in the trash. Obviously we don't do that for various environmental and other reasons, but it's just kind of a, a point to make. 
where you love to see the blue line is really low like it was here. So we've had various you know, spikes and troughs and what's been positive, what started late last year is a real actual decline in the commingled. Now, how that happens in the commingled, how the price declines is basically the resale value of that commodity is going up. So the amount that they're charging us for hauling it away is going down because they basically net out what that resale value is. So what you're actually seeing right now is basically it's off the chart because we actually have gotten paid for our commingled recycling for the first time ever in our history. We got a, maybe a few thousand dollars, uh, I think in the month of July. Um, we don't necessarily think that's going to continue at that level, but we're also not in the business of pricing out commodities markets in terms of recycled paper and commingled. So we think it's going to generally in terms of just my discussions with the, the refuse folks and the public works director, think it will normalize a little bit, but we hope it stays where it is right now as long as possible. It's a real benefit to the township. The green line that you see here goes with the right-hand side access. This is the paper pricing. So you can see that paper from 2014 through about into the end of 2017 was really a pretty decent number in terms of per tons. And then it really entered into a trough period. And then really what happened at the end of 2020, it started to escalate again. And now it's really gone up again. As I said, in this month here, it actually really ended up about 100, just over $120 a ton. Again, from my understanding from talking with refuse folks and them talking to their vendors, I would use an analogy that I think people will be familiar with. Everyone's uh, aware of kind of what's happening in the car market in terms of there aren't as many new cars because there aren't semiconductors. So new car prices are up. And since people can't maybe afford new cars, then used car prices are up. A similar sort of thing is happening in these commodity markets. So there's kind of a lack of raw materials right now in terms of maybe like virgin paper or plastics and things of that nature. So because of that, the price of the used has risen. So I think that's kind of a useful metaphor that hopefully helps you understand what's going on. We're not sure how far this is going to go the rest of this year or into next year. We hope from our financial perspective with this solid waste fund, it continues forever because it's extremely financial beneficial to the township. It really makes recycling pay over and over again. Um, but as you've seen, we've been at highs with paper before and then come to lows. And we've been at lows with commodities before and gone to highs relatively quickly in terms of things change. China stopped doing this. You know, uh, it really is a global market, but um, hopefully that helps give you a little bit of, of understanding about what all these squiggly lines means and, and what it means for the solid waste. Fund. In terms of where the fund is financially, um, it's in a much better place than it has been the last couple of years, mainly because of what I was just talking about. Um, I'm going to point out a couple things here. Uh, the 2020 numbers, we actually ended 2020 on the revenue side much better than we had anticipated. Uh, that was because of a couple of things that happened, some of which were one time. So DEP and these recycling grants, they've always run several years behind. So, you know, generally we get like the 2018 recycling grant in 2020. Well, I'm not sure what happened, but last year they actually spent, they actually gave, gave us 2019 or the 2018 and 2019 recycling grants in 2020. So they actually have finally like caught up. So we had like an extra, you know, 200,000 in grant revenue there. The other thing is we, we did better than anticipated in terms of the, the PIMIC refund revenue that we get in terms of claims that gets divided in terms of major funds. Um, so the portion that went to the solid waste fund was higher. And then we had the start of these commodity changes that you saw on the previous slide on the revenue side for paper, but also a little bit on the expenditure side or commingled. So we were anticipating we were going to end 2020 at around a 4% fund balance level. We ended at about 7%. So then with these commodity changes continuing this year, um, it's really put us in a much better position overall. So we're projecting right now to end this year at right around 11% of fund balance. Um, 2022, we do expect at this point for uh, deficits to resurface to a certain extent. That's really going to be driven. Um, by the uh, earlier item we talked about in terms of the overall trash disposal. Um, but we still believe with a over a 9% fund balance, um, we're still in pretty good shape. Obviously, um, 
you know, with all of our funds, you know, as we talked about at the uh, budget workshop, there's ARP fund dollars and things of that nature. So if there were to be certain spikes or uh, shocks to the solid waste fund that would occur, there are also, we have kind of other dollars that we can use and um, allocate as the board sees fit um, due to various situations. So overall, and really in a, in a decent place for this year, um, allows us um, to keep fee levels, uh, assuming the board is, is on board with that um, at the current rates um, in, in terms of how we move forward in 2022. So on those next steps, so um, again, no pressing need for us to adjust the fees in 2022. Um, you know, there's still a significant amount of uncertainty when we look beyond that in terms of, um, again, those contract costs, we're actually gonna be seeing, you're gonna be seeing contracts um, might be in October, if not in November, for the paper hauling and commingled. So again, those are kind of based, there's a, they're really based on the commodity markets, but there's basically almost kind of like their admin fee or their fixed costs. So we'll see where those come in. Um, and then we have labor agreements which expire in 2022. So we don't know where those are, are really heading as we move forward. So there's a lot of uncertainty beyond 2022, but at this point um, we feel confident uh, that the fees can stay at that current rate, assuming that the board agrees with that. And there doesn't have to be a formal vote on that, just kind of general staff direction. Um, there's no further public action um, uh, votes that need to be taken or anything else of that. Um, later on this year, we would again uh, plan to send out the solid waste subscription change cards to customers. Uh, that usually occurs around the mid-November period. Um, we also, maybe this year, maybe we'll ask, I know the board members have various um, email uh, accounts for their various constituents to maybe spread the word about that. If you don't want to change your solid waste subscription, you don't have to do anything. Uh, every year when we do this process, we get more response, whether it be online or people mailing us things back that basically say, I don't want to change anything. And we actually get people saying they want to change we try a different language in, in the letter every year. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll uh, try to coerce some board members to helping us out with that. But if you don't want to change anything, you can just recycle the paper that comes and we'll hopefully get some good money for it come December. So, and then the solid waste bill obviously will be on the tax bill that is mailed at the end of January of year. And that's all I have on the solid waste fund. I have to answer the question. Eric, that was uh, extremely well done, very thorough and uh, uh, explained so that everybody can follow it. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, I would ask that uh, as we get closer to year end, perhaps you or others on the staff can uh, write a few sentences, email them to all commissioners and uh, encourage the language that you would submit to, send to us to include in our next email, you know, blast, which we do at times that are not so regular. And, but uh, uh, it sounds like a good idea to uh, help all around. Um, and uh, no, I guess your explanation as to why paper prices are going up makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. if, if anything's growing, it is the number of delivery trucks that are in our community mm -hmm. uh, bringing boxes and boxes and boxes. And so um, uh, we, a year ago, spent a great deal of time um, on simplifying our system. Um, and uh, we, have, uh, we have now, because of the reasons you described with uh, um, paper caught, paper pricing that we receive going up, commingled costs going way down, grants from the state flowing uh, at an unusual level, and we have uh, also an acceptable fund balance. So I think your recommendation for, for no change makes a lot of sense. And with that, I'll ask if there are any other committee members who have any questions or comments for Eric. Vice President Gaffer. Chairman Zillow. Um, do Quick comments. The first one, Eric, you talked about the kind of give and take between the subscription level and the amount of waste. Um, I'm glad to see that the waste is down this year along with the subscription level. Um, I think as long as that's happening, we're in good shape. If the subscription level keeps dropping, but the waste stays flat, that's a, that's a real problem. 
Um, and you know, we're while it's gone down, it looks like it went down, I don't know, seven, eight percent, something like that over the peak from COVID. Um, we're still way up from 2016, 17. So that may be a really good goal for us, whether it's short term, long term, to maybe um, you know, set set that goal and figure out some policies to get us back to that 2016, 2017 level as a township. Um, the other um Thing I was really happy to see we we did make a very extensive change to the um, the subscription levels last year, and I'm really glad to see. I know there was there was some uncertainty and doubt about whether that would work, and that would cause some huge problems. Uh, really glad to see it hasn't. So um, that's all my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice President Gavin. I would say system has worked. Uh, President Bernheim. Yeah, thank you. Well, Eric, you don't have to do this now. I wouldn't expect you to have it, but at a later time when you make a presentation, be curious to know what percentage of the revenues is from the fees versus everything else. Um, so hey, I, I, when, I'll, I'll email you specifically right, right afterwards because it'll only take me about two seconds, but in terms of solid waste fee revenue versus the rest of it, right. probably in... 80 to 90%. Yeah, I mean, that, that, would have been, that would have been my guess. Yes. As, as there, there's the, very, very little besides right. the, the fee revenue. Right. And then it, it appear, right. And it appears that we've had, you know, some adjustments when people are doing this. There are more mini cans than were, there were before, which I will publicly state that means I owe from a bet to Commissioner Courtney $1. <laughs> so, um, but, um, you know, if that has that impact, you know, the, the amount of revenue would then go down if that continues. And I guess um, you know, just charting that and what we anticipate will be you know, helpful to figure out as we, as we go forward. But uh, I'll reiterate what uh, Commissioner Delhoff said. Uh, thanks, that was an excellent informative uh, presentation of this material. Thank you, President Bernheim. Commissioner McKeon. Thank you. <clears throat> I also wanted to echo a lot of things we heard tonight. Um, Eric, this is a fantastic presentation. I think last year the Finance Committee, and that's Commissioner Zelov, McComb, and Gavin did a great job coming up with a, a solid waste fee structure that would work. And here it looks like it really worked. And as we saw with the pool fees, we don't necessarily need to revisit fee structures every year. Sometimes you know, we can spend our time on other issues that may be a little more pressing. So um, it's great to hear that there's no pressing need to adjust the solid waste fees for 2022. And I, I just hope that uh, we don't try to do that. We use our time on some other issues. And that also gives a lot of consistency to the residents because then they know what to expect for next year. So thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you very much, Commissioner McKeon. And there was uh, Commissioner McComb also was uh, part of the Finance Committee. Uh, yeah. I, didn't, oh, I didn't hear that. I thought you didn't do it. Yeah, well, that was mentioned twice. Yeah. Very good. Other commissioners with uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, any members of the public have any questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you again, Eric. This is not an item for a vote tonight. So I very much, we very much appreciate the presentation. With that, let's move on to the fourth and final item on the Finance Committee agenda, which is a resolution in which uh, by enacting it, we would be creating a new fund. Speaking of enterprise funds, uh, we would be creating a new fund and it would be uh, temporary in nature, I presume, uh, and it'd be due to the receipt of funds from, from the American Rescue Plan. Eric, you want to tell us more? Yeah, so we talked about this a little bit at the budget workshop as part of the memo. Um, so from finance's perspective, the best way for us to manage these federal dollars, to be able to do accurate reporting that we need to do on a quarterly basis to the Department of Treasury and things of that nature, is to move these um, federal stimulus dollars into their own fund. This will be a special revenue fund, which basically means it can be used on those expenses which are allowed by the federal government. So the restrictions are everything that was in that memo that we gave you with the budget workshop in terms of that name. The dollars aren't going anywhere. You're going to see them in the budget document that will be released this fall. Uh, the interest will accrue in that fund, uh, but it just allows us to I think, report better on these things and also allows things to be a little bit more transparent, I think, overall in terms of where the dollars are and where the dollars go. Um, so as Commissioner uh, Zeloff was kind of alluding to, it wouldn't be a fund that is around in perpetuity. It would be a fund that is around for maybe roughly five years until all the dollars are spent. Um, once those dollars are spent, um, the fund would 
head into retirement unless there is a continued stimulus effort at, at some point or something <clears throat> of that nature. So what this resolution basically just does is basically authorize staff to create that fund. Um, we'll create it in this current fiscal year. It'll be included in all the budget documents you'll be seeing this fall, um, and we'll manage that appropriately. Happy to answer your question. Thank you, Eric, and I'll correct my earlier statement. It is, a, as you described, a special revenue fund, not an enterprise. Um, with that, are there committee members who have any questions or comments on this resolution, which is included in our packet? It is one page, uh, and it is essentially as Eric described it. Uh, seeing none, do any members of the public have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll move that this committee recommend to the Board of Commissioners the authorization of township staff to create a new fund, a special revenue fund, for reporting on American Rescue Plan activity. Is there a second? Vice President Gavrin seconds it. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. Uh, or say aye. Uh, <laughs> and are there any, uh, thank you, are there any who wish to vote no? Uh, seeing none, uh, Madam Secretary, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, President Bernheim, that concludes the work of the Finance Committee for this evening. Thank you very much, Commissioner Zeloff. It's greatly appreciated. So um, there, there's one thing I want to point out because I, I got a text. Somebody was asking, gee, why there's some commissioners who do not have masks. Those who do not are at their home. Um, and then occasionally when people speak, they take it off only for purposes of clarity because we've had some, no pun intended, feedback at times that it, it's hard to hear. But I will request that everybody who's in the room if they be kind enough to put on a mask and a courtesy for everyone else, that would be greatly appreciated. With that, that takes us to our next committee item, and that is the uh, Public Works Committee, and we'll recognize its chair, Commissioner McCann. Thank you, President Bernheim. Uh, there is only one item on the Public Works Committee agenda tonight, and that's reappointment to the Shade Tree Commission. And... I will make a motion to consider for recommendation to the Board of Commissioners the retroactive reappointment of Richard Widman and Robert Whitmer to the Shade Tree Commission for five-year terms, such terms to expire May 2026. Um, thank you. Um, Second. And with that, is there any, uh, I'm not aware of any public comment. Is there any no public comment? No. Is there any commissioner comments or questions? Uh, President Bernard? Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Collins. Oh. Uh, Commissioner McKinney, thank you. I, I would urge the uh, board to approve the reappointment of Mr. Whitman and Mr. Whitmer. I served with them on the Shade Tree Commission. They're both very capable and very knowledgeable and they are uh, real assets to the Shade Tree. Thank you very much, Commissioner McComb. Uh, Commissioner Durbin. I just wanna say we're really lucky to have them and I'm delighted they're willing to stay on. Thank you. And Commissioner O'Neill. Oh, thank you. Um, just to echo the two gentlemen we're about to reappoint, I think that um, it's a wonderful dynamic of the Shade Tree Commission and the members really complement each other and um, getting more involved within the Shade Tree Commission has been a particular joy this year. And I look forward to working with other commissioners to um, dig even deeper with these gentlemen and others. So thank you. Absolutely. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Okay. So with that, all in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. uh, anyone who's opposed? Okay. Uh, Madam Secretary, it looks like the motion passes unanimously. And with that, President Bernheim, that concludes the uh, business of the Public Works. Thank you very much, Commissioner McKeon. And uh, gentlemen, thank you for your continued service uh, to the community. That brings us to our next committee meeting, which is uh, Grants Community Development Committee. And we'll recognize its chair, Commissioner O'Neill. Oh, thank you so much. Um, we have a one participant. Um, I'm going to keep my mask on just in proximity of um, Commissioner Sinai. So um, we have one agenda item this evening, um, the approval of a mortgage increase for a home purchase mortgage recipient. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and make the motion um, and then we can take it from there. So consider the recommendation to the Board of Commissioners approval to allow a homeowner to participate in the township's home purchase program to increase the size of their first bank held mortgage and allow Lower Marion Township municipal liens to remain in second and third positions. Do I have a second before we open it up? Uh, okay, great, uh, Commissioner Valen. Um, and uh, with, do we have any other questions from the board before we hear from staff on any overview issues or any questions we have? 
Um, I might turn to Manager McNeely, if you don't mind, for just a quick overview of um, our policy relative to the um, debt ratio on this, which is in very, very good shape. Uh, sure, be glad to, Commissioner. Uh, this uh, this is a request that uh, has to come before the board because uh, they want to increase the mortgage uh, on the property, which we helped them originally buy. And in doing so, they may also be making some additional improvements. They're shortening the mortgage to a 15-year mortgage. Their credit is uh, scores are very good. Uh, the original mortgage was $125,000. The new mortgage is $155,000. Um, township liens amounted originally to $98,000. Uh, so there's still going to be 72% uh, you know, loan to, to value uh, uh, equity in the uh, project. And, um, but they can't proceed with the uh, refinancing to get a lower rate or to go to the 15-year term without uh, the board approving. Thank you. Thank you for that overview. I think that's helpful. Um, so in, in mortgage backing, um, usually the, the first the first position is held by the mortgage holder, the bank usually, and the second and third are usually the, in this case, the township lien. Um, so that is a standard position that we have been in or would be in anyway. Um, and we're not borrowing against our lien, it's that of the, the bank. So um, the risk to us is, um, you know, is we're, 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 not, um, we're not exposed. So um, I'd like to go ahead and put this up to anybody in the public if you have questions. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and like to call it for a vote then. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye and raising hands. Okay, um, seeing any opposed? None opposed. Okay, great, the motion passes unanimously. Um, that is all for the committee, so thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner O'Neill, greatly appreciated. Um, that then brings us to our next committee meeting for this evening. It is the Building and, and Planning Committee, and we will call on its co-chair, Commissioner Sinai. Okay, thank you, President Bernheim. And uh, Jody will let me know if you can't yeah. hear me. Um, so we have eight items on our agenda tonight, uh, and we are going to start with the first one. Um, I can pull it up here. Uh, and I'm going to um, put it as a motion, uh, move that we consider for recommendation, to recommend to the Board of Commissioners that they approve the release of funds held in escrow as improvement guarantees in accordance with section 135.5 of the Township Code for the following, 450 Lancaster Avenue, which is the Haverford School, and 396 West Lancaster Avenue, Chase. Do any commissioners wish to discuss anything? Okay, do I have a second? Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, different segments. Uh, no discussion from the commissioners. Uh, any public comment? Uh, Jody, anyone online? Okay, uh, I'll call the motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, extensions, uh, that passes unanimously. Uh, the next is we have the approval of certificate of appropriateness. And I guess that is on page nine of our packet. Uh, and I will move to recommend to the Board of Commissioners uh, that they approve uh, the installation of a wall sign, a projected blade sign, and vinyl window graphics in the former Christian Science Reading Room building, subject to zoning approval, uh, and with a hanging sign bracket to be mounted to mortar joints in compliance with Secretary of the Interior Standard 9. Uh, and we have detailed slides in our packet. Uh, do I have a second? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Grimes. Uh, any uh, commissioners wish to discuss this item? Okay, uh, any public comment? Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? May that pass unanimously. The next item on our agenda is a historical commission application. Uh, and before I read this in as a motion, uh, I'm going to ask uh, our historic uh, planner, uh, Greg Pritchard, uh, to tell us where this thing he's on okay thank you commissioner sinai and uh i'm um, sorry i can't be there with you all this evening but i'm glad to be joining you this way um i do have an update on this particular application and uh show so i will share some slides with you uh, now this uh, property is 88 Merbrook lane in marion station 
Um, the recommendation, actually, there, there were two parts to it um, that the commission uh, voted on. And uh, the first was an approval to recommend a two week delay based on the uh, then current design of the uh, second floor of the residence, which was uh, damaged by a falling tree. Um, the um, second floor has to be completely rebuilt. And uh, the original scheme uh, reviewed by the Historical Commission uh, was uh, a change in the, the shape of that roof um, that uh, was recommended by the applicant's engineer. Um, but uh, the um, second part of the commission's recommendation stated that uh, should the plan be modified to reduce the overall scale, the massing of that uh, roof form, um, the commission recommended the reduction of that delay to zero days and uh, with the subcommittee to review the modified plans. Uh, so I'm uh, happy to report that the subcommittee um, was able to review um, revised plans from the applicants and uh, recommended that reduction to zero days. Um, here is a picture of the, the tree after it fell on the house. Um, this is its view from the street uh, from Merrybrook Lane in Marion Station. Side view, you can see some of the tree damage on the side there. And again, this whole second floor has to be taken down and completely rebuilt. And then the uh, right side and rear. Um, this was the uh, previously proposed roof line. The red line shows the uh, current uh, slope slopes of the, uh, the roof. Um, as you can see, the original scheme showed uh, that it would be kind of expanded outward and uh, really would have changed the appearance of uh, um, that roof line in a huge way. That's what the commission felt was inappropriate. Um, they've since uh, reduced that, and uh, this is what the um, outline, uh, um, newly proposed outline um, looks like. And then uh, the elevations, this is a side elevation, again, previously proposed, and then newly proposed, it uh, is reduced uh, quite significantly. And uh, then the rear elevation, it would also change. So again, the commission recommended uh, approval of uh, this revised design with a zero day delay. Okay, so the motion I'm going to make is going to be a somewhat different package. So I am going to move that we recommend to the Board of Commissioners that they approve both historical commission applications that we have here. One is 88 Merbrook Lane in Marion Station, the one we just discussed, which is a class two. Uh, and the other is 1332 Meadowbank Road, Villanova, also a class two, where they're going to replace all the windows in the home with Pella Architect series replacement windows with simulated divided lights. Uh, do I have a second? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any discussion on either of these? Okay, seeing none, any public comment? Okay, uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, any opposed? Uh, abstentions? So I think it passes unanimously of the commissioners who uh, are here, we are missing uh, just a couple. Uh, so we now move to the fourth item on our agenda, uh, which is a preliminary land development plan for 2, 6, and 10 South Bryn Mawr Avenue. Uh, and I think we will start this uh, with our Director of Building and Planning, Chris Leslie. Or maybe not. <laughs> 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 yes, I'm going to be presenting this application. Okay. Um, so, the sign we were moving through the agenda with alacrity. <laughs> okay. So as you mentioned, this is a preliminary land development application. Um, the properties um, uh, associated with it are to Bryn Mawr Avenue. This is located right at the intersection of Lancaster Avenue and South Bryn Mawr Avenue. This is two, this is six, and this is 10 Bryn Mawr Avenue. Um, the applicants seeking approval to demolish the three two-story office buildings and parking associated on the parcels, consolidate the three lots into one, and to construct a four-story mixed use building, which includes 12,000, approximately 12,000 square feet of um, commercial space, 
that is located on the ground floor. It includes 112 dwelling units in the upper stories, 222 parking spaces, of which 159 are located underground and 62 at grade. And it includes a 7,500 square foot public gathering space that's accessed from South Bryn Mawr Avenue and Lancaster Avenue. Um, these are the existing conditions showing the location of the buildings. Three properties. Here are just some images of the of the frontage. You can see this is to Bryn Mawr Avenue. This is Lancaster Avenue. As you round the corner, you can see the building. Um, this is six, and this is ten. Um, this is the building proposed that includes the 12,000 square feet of commercial space located at the ground floor. As I said, the plan includes 7,500 square feet of public gathering space that's located internal to the site, access from Lancaster Avenue, which is located right here, and, oh, sorry, Lancaster Avenue, which is located right here, and South Bryn Mawr Avenue. These are the access points to the public gathering space. Um, as I said, there are 231 parking spaces. The 159 are provided below, um, below ground and 62 are provided at grade. So that's 100, that's 1.5 per unit and four per thousand. The applicant's also providing 120 parking, bicycle parking spaces. Um, we have an illustrative site plan showing the streetscape amenities and greening, as well as the interior greening. Since the tentative sketch plan review, the applicant has worked with staff to relocate the access driveway along the property line. And this aligns with the Bryn Mawr, the Bryn Mawr Village Master Plan. Um, the applicant has been in conversations with the adjacent property owner um, located right here in pink to um, provide shared access from this driveway. And that would have the benefit of removing the, that property's access along South Bryn Mawr Avenue. Staff has included a condition requiring the applicant to continue to pursue shared access with that adjacent property owner. Um, this is a sketch that shows what shared access between the two properties would look like. Um, this is the adjacent property at 14 South Bryn Mawr Avenue, and this is the applicant's um, proposed building right here. So the access would be along South Bryn Mawr, and then um, the adjacent access would um, off of that shared drive. Staff's included a condition requiring if shared access um, is achieved that the applicant will continue to work with staff on the width of the sidewalk and landscaping along the shared access drive. Another recommendation staff has included is that a the applicant install vehicular pull-off area off of South Bryn Mawr Avenue. This would be an additional area. There is a few spaces that are provided along the access drive interior to the site but this would provide additional space off of South Bryn Mawr Avenue that would allow for uh, short-term deliveries and vehicle pull-off. Um, and we are recommending a revision to the condition number 10 that speaks to this um, pull-off area, requiring just strengthening that condition a little, requiring the applicant to, the applicant shall, working with the township at PennDOT, install the vehicular pull-off area along South Bryn Mawr Avenue. As I mentioned, there, the public gathering space that's being provided internal to the site, staff has included a number of recommendations um, which speak to hours of operation, lighting, signage, access, and maintenance that have been included in the recommended conditions. Here are some views of the public gathering space. This is a view into the space from the South Bryn Mawr access. And this is towards the back of the space. And there's a combination of landscaping, seating, The proposal requires a partial waiver of the natural features code to allow some of the required trees to be provided offsite or a contribution to be provided. Um, staff notes that the Brimar Village District permits a maximum of 100% impervious surface, which does create a conflict with the minimum planting standards. Um, staff feels considering the quality of the streetscape design and the quantity of perennial and ornamental grasses on site that we are supportive of the request of relief. Um, some other amenities to the site that I wanted to point out is um, we have included a condition requiring the applicant to work with staff and SEPTA to provide a bus shelter adjacent to the site. Um, 
We are continuing to work with the applicant on the alignment of crosswalks and ADA ramps and the alignment of the pedestrian access across the applicant's access drive. Um, there have been some comments about whether or not there is access located along the driveway and this illustrates the, the pathway provided. It's five feet in length. Um, and I also have some architectural images. This is the, um, this is the proposed facade along South Burnmore Avenue. It's a combination of brick and stone. Um, and this is, and this is the site as you would see it from um, Lancaster Avenue. This portion of the building would not be visible. This would be behind other adjacent properties. Um, the applicant has also provided some renderings showing the proposed building. This is at the intersection of um, Lancaster and South Burnmore Avenue. You can see Ludington Library right here. As you turn that corner, the building's located right here. You can again see the access to the public gathering space. Sorry. And this would be from across the street. Um, this being the access driveway, you have a vehicular pull-off area right here internal to the site. And this is the facade as seen from Lancaster Avenue. The access to the public gathering space would be located right here. The applicants also provided a list of sustainable features that are included in the project. And again, they are seeking partial relief of um, the natural features code to provide the minimum required planting um, or a contribution of the equivalent of 18 trees. Of the okay, thank you, Jillian. Um, so for expediency, I'm going to start by just reading this in as a motion. So I will move that we recommend to the Board of Commissioners approval uh, to approve the preliminary land development plan dated May 3rd, 2021. That shows the demolition of three two-story office buildings, the consolidation of three lots into one, and the construction of a four-story mixed-use building to contain 12,000 or 11,955 square feet of ground-level commercial space and 110 dwelling units and 75, 17 square feet of public gathering space and streetscape improvements uh, to grant the partial relief under Natural Features Code Section 1019 and to amend Condition 10 uh, the way that uh, uh, Jillian read it. Uh, do I have a second? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Zeloff. Um, Commissioner, uh, questions or comments? And I'll note that we have uh, representatives from the applicant here if you have questions for them. Okay, Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you. Um, very quickly on conditional uh, use number nine uh, regarding the shared access driveway. Um, I'm wondering about the, uh, can we put the graphic back up if it isn't too difficult? If not, okay. Um, my question really pertains to if we have any idea of what, how many, Pieces, how many traffic units would be going into that driveway coming off of Bryn Mawr Ave? Um, because that could, depending on time of day or the number of clients or patients are coming into that site, that, that will create a choke point on Bryn Mawr Ave. Um, and I'm wondering whether there are any other considerations given for other access points, either behind the building or down on um, uh, the street to the left, closer to the hospital entrance. Uh, Joe Mastronardo said he will look up the number that was in. Oh, thank there. you. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Commissioner O'Neill. Uh, any other commissioners with comments or questions? Um, yeah. I see Commissioner Durbin. Yes, I just wanted to get a clarification for the public um, in terms of the access to the Bryn Mawr Film Institute, which is what mm -hmm. I consider a township treasure. Um, I, I wasn't clear on it, and I just wanted to have that for everybody who was watching. So um, individuals that want to access the Film Institute will be able to enter um, this driveway on South Bryn Mawr Avenue and drive directly to the back of Bryn Mawr Theater. Um, I do believe there is some, um, there will be some parking shared between the, the two sites and the applicants permitting the Film Institute patrons to park on site. Um, how about during construction? That is a great question. And um, I think the applicant is here. And I... Mr. Burson, do you want to come and answer that question? 
Hi, I'm George Brosman representing the applicant. Um, it's my understanding that during construction, the whole site will need to be um, occupied by that so that during construction, there won't be any ability to uh, provide spaces. But of course, after construction, we believe we have made an agreement with the Film Institute to allow the access in the park. Well, I frankly think that's not an acceptable answer. I'd like township staff to try and do something to help Bryn Mawr Film Institute from not being prohibited from having patrons during construction. How long is construction going to last? And I, I should point out that uh, there's lots of other parking in the area, so there will be other options. Um, I'd have to ask David to talk about the duration of construction. Bryn Mawr Film Institute has a lot of um, disabled and elderly um, um, patrons, and um, I'm thinking that, you know, you're going to have to get them there somewhere. Yeah, I believe there's many other ways to access the property, but... Commissioner Durbin, um, staff's been in touch with the Bryn Mawr Film Institute, and we've, we've actually spoken about this. Um, there's going to be need to be some temporary parking, perhaps some temporary loading and, and um, drop-off areas for this during construction. So we're in contact with it, and we're going to make every effort to, to while this lot is out of um, offline, to be able to address that during that case. Right now, we haven't identified a spot, but I think we're looking to do that. There is some space behind it that's owned by Mainline Health on Central Avenue. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, we don't have that answer here. It's not really the applicant's obligation to do that. But the township stepping in because of our efforts in the Bryn Mawr um, Business District to try to accommodate. Well, I am not entirely sure I agree with you that it's not their obligation. There's been a long time easement across that property for Bryn Mawr Film Institute patrons to get there. And I just think if this is going to be under construction for a really long time, we can't do that to one of our township treasures. We just can't. And I, I want something better presented to us if you want my vote. Okay. Um, just, just to clarify, there is actually not a formal easement in place. It's been a handshake agreement between the Film Institute and this um, and the current property owner to allow the parking. Um, it's really done on, on the goodness of the property owner to be offering these Bryn Mawr Film Institute, and everybody's trying to make their best efforts to do this, but the Bryn Mawr Institute doesn't actually have rights to that park. I'm, I'm not talking about parking. They do have some parking back there. I'm talking about access. There is no access easement presently. One is being granted to them, which are, but presently there is no um, um, access how long is your construction going to be? Because you can't cut them off for a couple of years. You just can't. Yeah, please, you can come and answer that question. So, so David Delaporta from Cornerstone. To, <clears throat> the construction would be approximately 18 to 22 months. Okay, thank you, sir. Jillian, are you going to add something? Sorry, I just wanted to add um, that this is the location of the Bryn Mawr Theater parking. It, it, I believe the access comes off Summit Grove currently. Um, with this proposal, there will be an additional driveway added. It is not, there is not currently a driveway from this site onto this parking area. Um, I have never accessed that from Summit Grove, but if you have an access, please show it to us. People have always accessed it from um, Bryn Mawr Avenue. I believe there's also, is it Central Avenue? There's also access. Yeah, you can see it in the area. There were, fence, there were fences there before. So if you're opening up a fence, that's fine. It'll make me happy. <laughs> Commissioner Durbin, if I, could, if I can make a suggestion, that because I, I, I fully appreciate in, uh, your, your line of questioning, that maybe we can give give staff during this, the, the period of the other commissioner's comments some time to, to think about this and come back. Maybe there's signage they can do if there's other access to the parking lot um, and see if they can uh, uh, kind of try to address your concern. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Derman. Um, 
Other commissioner uh, questions or comments at this stage? Uh, commissioner Zell. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Sinai. Um, I have some questions, uh, so I, I guess I'd like to ask uh, David Della Porta to come up. Uh, David, a question was asked uh, online today about sidewalk. So can you explain on the proposed shared driveway um, about sidewalks that are on your drawing? Can you find that image? So this uh, image is showing the entry drive from South Bryn Mawr um, going back toward the Film Institute. And you see on the right-hand side in the kind of orange and the red, those are pavers. It's a five foot wide sidewalk going back to the Film Institute property. You know, and it runs along um, our uh, at grade parking garage. And that's the parking garage that we're building, making open to the public, including to the Grimmar Film Institute. And George referenced the agreement that we're making with the Film Institute that we're providing, you know, a number of hours of free parking for the patrons of the, of the Film Institute. And, and David, uh, thank you for that. And on, on the other side of your driveway, uh, you have a tentative agreement with the property owner? We, we do. The, Can uh, you explain that and what would there be a sidewalk on that side? Um, so I do not believe we have the room um, for a sidewalk on that boundary, which uh, I don't know if we have an image that maybe we'll just go back. It's like, yeah, that might be the best. So as you can as you can see there, we do have a, an agreement and concept for the shared parking with the property owner. Um, and what we're uh, doing is taking the area that you see in the green is all paved right now, right uh, up against their building. And so that's the intent is to make that as much of that green as possible, um, provide the uh, driveway access at the front end of their property and then also a pedestrian access from their front door across to our property. But I don't believe we have the room to create a sidewalk on that side. It would, it would pinch too close to their building. We can, we can take a look. Bob, am I uh, waiting here? Are we able to get a, looking at the stuff right now? Can you come up and help me? Yeah, I can help you. There's a walkway. There's a walkway from the, the parking. Uh, there's a walkway along uh, the building uh, for access from the parking to their main entrance. Um, but along the shared driveway, uh, there is no walkway there. There's a little bit of grade change um, that would preclude that. And also it's on a neighboring property. Oh, thank you. Um, David, you mentioned an 18 to 22 month construction cycle. So if preliminary plan is approved next week, uh, then the next step is final approval, which would be uh, presenting a plan in which all six, some 67 conditions are addressed. Uh, so given that schedule, when do you project or anticipate commencing construction? I would assume that's going to be a six to nine month period before we could uh, address all of those conditions, obtain permits that we require. So mid next year would be our projection. Just mid mid 22 mid and 20. 18 to 22 months from there. Correct. All right, thank you. Um, and then uh, a, a question that was raised at the Bryn Mawr Civic Association meeting on Monday night. So it really is in the form of a request. The buildings are empty. Um, they look empty. Uh, and they're, they're, the exterior and the, the parking lots are not well maintained at the moment. So um, given that they're six to nine months away from starting, if this is approved uh, with, you know, preliminary plan is approved, 
uh, then um, please maintain the uh, condition of the of the site until it's fenced off and construction commences. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sine, I those are the questions I have. I now have some comments. Now would be a good time to offer my comment. Um, you know, uh, let me circle back to you for comments <clears throat> after we have public comment. Um, and we'll just take remaining questions. Right. Um, thank you, Commissioner Zoloff. Any other questions by commissioners? Uh, Jillian, I have I have a, a question because one thing that we were asking for is uh, for partial relief in the natural features code. Um, and you know, if I look at the the site plan, it does seem like every possible bit of the of the streetscape does have trees over it. Um, but I'll ask my usual question, which is, what are in our conditions to make sure that those trees are actually healthy, large, shade producing, canopy kind of trees, as opposed to the trees that we sometimes get, which kind of you know look like you know uh, uh, you know, they kind of wither away. So there are standards um, related to the um, diameter of tree to be planted um, within the Natural Features Code. We also have maintenance standards that have been included in the conditions of approval requiring the applicant to, um, to maintain all of the landscaping that's provided along the streetscape. And do we also have specifications about the kind of trees and the size that they're going to grow to? So it's my understanding the applicant has been in conversation with the Shade Tree Commission, um, and I do think that they are going back to the Shade Tree Commission, and there has been a conversation about species. Um, there's also been uh, conditions included that require um, additional protections under the sidewalk to increase growth and health. Terrific. And, and, and I'll observe that this has been a series of improvements that staff have made to the typical conditions over time. So we were actually getting much better greening standards that we have had in the past. Very grateful. Thank you. Um, any other? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, President Vernon. Yeah, th th thank you, Commissioner Sign. I, uh, I just uh, I emailed Commissioner Durbin something which may address her concern. I don't know if she had an opportunity to look at it. Okay. Thank you, President Vernon. So, but Anna, you're on mute, Anna. I'll look it up right now. All right. So if I may make a process suggestion, I think we have a public comment. We might have a little bit of stuff yeah. here and then we will come back to this. And we'll right. okay. Thank you. I just wanted, since Commissioner Durbin's not here, to look at her email. Okay. Thank you. That works no. out. I, I, was, I was planning on circling back to that. So if okay. we have something in place by that point, that'd be, that'd be excellent. Um, okay, any other commissioner questions? Uh, Commissioner Courtney. Thank you, Commissioner Sonia. Sorry, sorry I'm late and going a little out of order here. I just wanted to ask about the trees. This is something that came up in our budget workshop, and I wonder if there's been any progress uh, with regard to the money in lieu. Can we use that anywhere in the township, or does it have to be within a certain vicinity of the development? And I'm sorry if you addressed this already in your presentation. Since I'm primarily responsible for that money in lieu with these conditions of approval for the last 10 years, I think I'm best can. Some some of the approvals where there's money in lieu are specifically referenced to a particular neighborhood. It might be a little bit to Winwood, there might be a little bit to Ardmore, might be a little bit to Val Kinwood. Generally, the conditions have been written to try to put the trees close to where they should be. Kind of like we use recreation funds. The way we have this, it's not written. Um, it's written that you would try to put them in the Bryn Mawr area. But we have we have some money that can be used township wide, and it has been used township wide. That's somewhat unencumbered, but it's almost on a case by case basis. I don't have the numbers specifically how that's all broken down, but I can provide that to you offline. So, so for this particular uh, relief, is this money only available for Bryn Mawr? I don't have it. I think we have it. It's unencumbered, so it would be available um, township wide. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank okay. you, thank you, Commissioner Court. Uh, any other commissioners with, with questions? Okay, so now we'll turn to uh, public. Oh, sorry, Joe. Yeah. Just circling back to Commissioner O'Neill's question about the, the site driveway. Okay, uh, the, the proposed driveway um, functions comparably to the, uh, uh, the uh, as far as the capacity of the driveway to the existing site as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in the AM peak, there's an actual reduction in the number of uh, trips. Uh, just for comparison, in, in, in the morning, uh, 44 uh, 
cars, you know, 44 vehicles in during the, the peak hour uh, are proposed where there was 63 uh, when the site was fully occupied. Uh, in the, the afternoon, uh, during the week, uh, 59, and 59 proposed, 46 uh, were, were attributed to the existing site. Uh, the biggest difference would be on the weekend. It was office use, so it was very light. On the, the traffic was light on the weekend, and uh, this, this site show, imposes about 76 uh, trips during the peak hour. So uh, it, it's pretty comparable. The location of the driveway is well suited because it's as far away from the intersection, uh, Brimar Avenue, Lancaster Avenue, as possible on the site uh, to give a nice uh, uh, distance uh, for uh, to avoid conflicts with uh, the vehicles that are accessing the intersection. Okay, thank you. In my mind, just so you understand the question. Um, Lancaster Avenue, North Lincoln at Villanova University, where there's a one-way street on the campus, and the cars get stuck mid-block across Lancaster Avenue, mm -hmm. and it is a dangerous condition, and I, the hope is that this wouldn't be that, and it sounds like it won't be given the count, so that's wonderful news. Don't think it'll exasperate anything. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have, we have a one submitted public comment. Uh, it's from Michael Pollock in Ardmore. Uh, who uh, uh, notes that the county report recommends that the developer, quote, explore whether a pedestrian walkway could be provided among the internal driveway to also improve pedestrian accessibility within this block. And he asks whether that has been done. Uh, and I believe that comment was addressed this evening. Uh, so thank you very much for, for submitting that comment. Uh, Jody, do we have any other comments on Zoom or in person? No. All right, so at this point I'm going to... Sorry? I don't know about Okay, sorry. Do uh, anyone uh, care to provide public comment? Please come up uh, to uh, this podium to my right, to your left. Um, introduce yourself. And uh, we generally try and keep comments for, for three minutes or less. Uh, I'm Sam Scott, uh, Executive Director of Bryn Mawr Film Institute. I want to thank everybody, uh, specifically, uh, Commissioner Durbin, I thank you for your kind words and support. Uh, you're not alone and we appreciate it. I just wanted to uh, give a point of clarification. Uh, today, I uh, sent a uh, document to uh, Mr. Brosman, counsel for the applicant, um, and hopefully the United States Postal Service will have it on its desk by tomorrow morning. It is a signed document which is a parking and easement agreement uh, between the applicant and Bryn Mawr Film Institute. And uh, we've worked uh, at length to get this done, and uh, we each uh, made some compromises, uh, but I'm confident that it's, a, it's a, an agreement that will serve us all well as the community itself. In terms of the easement, uh, one of the things during construction, the agreement calls for uh, that that access to our rear lot, if you're familiar with that, and it was on the map there, uh, during construction, that that will be open at all times. We understand, they have, we now have free access to the parking until uh, demolition and construction time, so we're happy about that. And then, of course, once it gets fenced off, if it becomes obviously a safety issue, we will no longer park there and have our uh, patrons park there. But for the time being, we appreciate their, uh, they're allowing us to do, uh, to do that, to park there. And uh, for the period of time where we don't have access, I'm confident that they will make best efforts to make some accommodation, as I think we just heard. So I just wanted to uh, offer my thanks to uh, the applicants and to the commissioners who've been helping us on this. And uh, Scott Zeloff, of course, thank you uh, for your help. And I look forward to this. I think it's going to be... Uh, a wonderful project and uh, hopefully we'll all be better for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any other public, please come up and again introduce yourself, make your comments. Yes. David Barron, 132 Pennsylvania Avenue. I know I've, I've spoken to Scott about it once before and um, Can you speak in and mic a, in a little yeah. louder please? We, we need you to increase your volume. So if you could okay. speak louder and directly do this? the mic, that'd be great. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, I know that basically you have a, a beautiful building that's going up, and uh, it's going to make a big difference in the center of Bryn Mawr. Uh, there's one little problem, uh, as I mentioned last week to those of you who are here. You have um, at the corner, uh, when the new building is uh, built, 
you're going to turn the corner from Bryn Mawr Avenue and walk directly to the film festival, as the case may be. And you've got one atrocious building there, which everybody knows because you've seen it many times. I believe it was at one point an Asian restaurant a long time ago. I understand that the commissioners and the administration uh, have nothing they can do about it, absolutely nothing. And uh, I know the builder I think, was told last week that he tried to contact him, and who knows if, if, the, if he or she's even alive, as the case may be. And I think that's very sad, as the case may be. And I just didn't know if there's something can be done about it. If there's absolutely nothing under law or anything else that can be changed to do it, at least do what they did down in, uh, in Ardmore when our favorite place, Ruby's, closed. They put up these beautiful little murals or something. Instead of walking past, coming out of around the corner, all of us say, my God, what happened here? And then you've got the restaurant, and then you've got the beautiful thing. So there's got to be something here to do. And I'm not sure what it is, but it, it sure makes sense because it's deplorable. The second point, and I think uh, one of your commissioners, a woman, uh, was talking about um, access to um, where the buildings are going. As you know, you had the wisdom to put up a crosswalk between Haverford Avenue and um, Old Lancaster. Very smart. <laughs> so when you cross over to the hospital, you don't get killed on the way. I'm a little worried here about you're taking up almost the entire, except for PNC Bank, the entire area from Old Lancaster to um, Lancaster Avenue. And I'm saying to myself, what if I'm in the middle of the block, I park at the library, or park on along the street? Okay, you can either walk all the way down Lancaster and around, or you can walk all the way up to Old Lancaster and around. Has there been any thought, because I think everybody logically, being honest with yourselves, would agree that there's going to be a hell of a lot more traffic, foot traffic and, and automobile traffic than there were ever in the buildings that were there. People were in their building, they came out at 5 o'clock and that's it. And I just didn't know if there was any study done about maybe putting something in the middle of the thing there so people could cross off. You're in a wheelchair, you have to go across, oh, i got to go all around here and so on, people with canes and so on. Because it's a large even for people that are active and run and jog and so on. It's a long walk. And it just might make sense to at least explore something. Thank you. OK, thank you. Any other public comment? OK, seeing none, uh, any commissioner uh, response to public comments? Sorry. Oh, do we have another? Oh, I'm sorry. OK. Sorry. I had just, I live on Pennsylvania Avenue in Bryn Mawr. Um, I just want clarification about the long period, 18 months to 22 months, when we will have construction crews there. I don't have in my mind the number of construction workers. However, I am concerned about where will they park. Where, and I know there is something in the specifications that that has to be answered, but is there anything you can inform us about this evening? We, we have not worked out a logistics plan for that yet, but they will have to find their own parking at some point. And the number yep. of workers varies widely through that time period. At some points early on, there's very few, and then over time, the numbers grow. But they will certainly have to find off-site parking, um, but we just haven't gotten to the point of knowing what that is yet. So, so they you, won't Delbert. park. I mean, I mean, so, so you can make yeah. your comments. Sorry. And, and we <laughs> Sorry. will take your comments, and then we will perhaps have thank you. respond to it. But thank it's you. not a conversation. So thank you. Um, OK. Uh, Jillian, is there a condition about, about construction parking? There is a condition requiring construction parking to be on site. OK. And a construction parking plan to be submitted and a supervisor to be on site to respond to questions about parking okay thank you very much Johnny. so 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 we all know this because we do this every time that you know a standard condition for for land development here is that the construction parking has to be contained on site uh, and so that will be part of the process um, okay any other public comment okay um, so so I am going to uh, turn to Commissioner Durbin and uh, President Bernheim at this point to see if there's something that uh, they would like to add. 
Uh, I'll defer to Commissioner Durbin. She's the one that brought this forth to okay. see if that is um, what I sent to her in, in addition to the comments that we ju just heard from Dermore Institute, if, if that's sufficient or if there's some adjustment Commissioner Durbin wants to make to some suggested language. Okay. Commissioner Durbin, do you want to, do you want to uh, pipe in at this point? Well, I'm interested in hearing from staff if there is actually access from Summit into that parking lot, because I'm certainly not aware of it. I'm not sure I understood what Bryn Mawr Film Institute said about their access during construction, but I think 18 to 22 months is going to be really tough for senior citizens and disabled people. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Durbin. Uh, Chris or Jillian, do you want to... Um, currently, Commissioner Durbin, Durbin and I, I apologize, I apologize, I apologize. I'll, I'll pull up a, up a graphic, graphic in a second. In a second. There, are there are a number of public, public parking, parking areas, areas in Bryn Mawr. Um, the biggest one is Lot 7. And if somebody, that's the logical spot that if you were going to park, that's the next lot you would go to. If I couldn't park in this lot, I would go to Lot 7. Lot 7, one naturally would cross over at the intersection of Bryn Mawr and Lancaster Avenue and then walk along this Lancaster Avenue to Bryn Mawr Film Institute. So you have access along the public right-of-way to access the site. There's also access off of Central Avenue coming back from the other side, which is the other public parking, which is off of um, Summit Grove Avenue, which is completely open, that comes along the back, along Central Avenue, back up to the front door of the, uh, of the movie theater. Well, that's lovely, but when you're disabled, that's a really long walk, and I suggest that you try doing it with maybe a boot on. <laughs> um, you know, maybe the township can do something with um, a drop-off zone. And, that, and that's what we've had those conversations with, um, with uh, but, the Bryn Mawr Film but Institute. I'd really like to know if yeah. we could get back access to that parking lot um, behind the Bryn Mawr Film Institute. Uh, that's something I think we'll look into, and I'll be able to report out on that. There are multiple property owners back there. Um, there are some cross easements. Let's take a look at that. Uh, I can't respond to that tonight. I'll have to look at that, but I'll be able to report back on, report out on that at a later date. Huh. Well, I mean, I'd be interested in a condition that, um, you know, they have that the um, the applicant has to provide some kind of access for elderly and disabled um, patrons of the Brimar Film Institute to get to the closest parking. So, so Commissioner Durbin, if if you would like to 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 make a motion with the condition. Then let's do it that way, so we can we can move it through the process. Um, or if you want to confer with staff to try and get that in, um, but but it's going to be hard to like, you know, unless you make this like a motion as a motion, it's going to be very difficult for us to deal with. I'll make a motion. Yeah, please I'll make do. A motion that there should be a condition that they have to to provide some kind of um, access, reasonable access for um, elderly and disabled patrons of Bryn Mawr Film Institute during the construction. Okay. Um, motion, do we have a second? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Sienta. So let's have some discussion on this. Yeah, it, it, if I may, thank, yes. th thank you very much. First, let me just drop back. Condition 42, as it currently exists, is all construction-related vehicles shall be parked on site at or, or at a, a remote location. No construction related vehicles may park on the street. This includes personal vehicles operated by construction workers or vehicles operated for construction workers, material suppliers, product vendors, and all construction trades engaged in projects. Hopefully this addresses the young lady's uh, question about What's going to happen? They got to be on site. They can't, in an, and are there another remote location and not clog up the streets? And that's the construction vehicles or people driving there to work. All right, so that that's already there. What I would propose, which I hope would address the concerns that Commissioner Durbin has raised, and dovetails off of the comments from the Bryn Mawr Institute, that there appears to be a good working relationship as opposed to a mere, you know, nod of the heads or handshake to um, amend 
condition 42 to include the following. During construction, the applicant shall work with the Township and Bryn Mawr Institute in order to minimize uh, disruption to the Bryn Mawr Institute and to provide access for its patrons. I don't think here this evening we can get any more specific, but if there's the obligation to go forward and do that, and certainly that would keep in mind those people who have some, you know, some disabilities. And hopefully, Commissioner Durbin, that addresses, you know, the concerns that you have. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm not sure we can get more details right here, right now. Uh, Commissioner Durbin, would you consider that a friendly amendment? Well, um, you know, I, I always am concerned about the weakness of work with language because it doesn't always work. Okay, okay. so, 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 so we're going to continue with discussion on Commissioner Durbin's and then we will bring it to a vote and then if the, that we uh, will have then turn to, to Commissioner uh, President Bernheim's suggestion. Uh, any discussion on Commissioner Durbin's motion? Any other discussion? Okay, Commissioner Zoll. Uh As to Commissioner Durbin's motion, I think we did hear from Sam Scott of the Bryn Mawr Film Institute that there is an agreement between the Film Institute and the developer to provide access to the Film Institute's rear parking lot during construction. Seems to address the issue raised. To clarify, there is no access to the Film Institute's rear parking lot from Summit Grove Avenue. Access would be over a over private property owned by others. Um, so uh, it seems to, uh, I'd like to hear from the applicant, but it seems that the the motion proposed by President Bernheim is uh, what was. Um, said by the Film Institute by, uh, in terms of their agreement with the applicants, uh, with the applicant. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Zoll. I mean, it, is, it is not lost on me that you know, the Bryn Mawr Film Institute is a treasure to the township, and it would take a particularly you know, obtuse property developer to not recognize that it would be an enormous benefit to themselves <laughs> as a neighbor, right? And so I presume everyone's interests are aligned in you know, keeping the health of the Bryn Mawr Film Institute continuing, uh, that would be nice to have some work with language in it. Uh, Commissioner Grimes, did you want to? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll just say very briefly, I mean, I, I agree with the comments here, and I certainly uh, sympathize with the spirit of what Commissioner Durbin is suggesting, but I'm reluctant to impose an absolute obligation um, on the, on the, uh, the applicant to make the access available if it just can't be done um, because look I'm not an engineer I haven't gone out and looked at this I think they've gotten the message today uh, I think that you know, I would agree with something I think along with with what President Bernheim suggested but I don't think an absolute obligation is the way to go so thank you <coughs> Mr. Bersman what can you what can you you know, commit to at this point um, I had the concerns that Commissioner Grimes had, but I think we've heard some some ideas here, um, and I think um, we would like to work with the staff um, on this, you know, over the next week, and see what uh, options may be available. Um, I'm not sure Mr. Scott is right that the easement does provide for the access uh, during construction. I don't know that that's possible, so um, I don't want to, uh, I have to reread it, but I don't recall that. So I don't want to leave you with an impression that may not be correct. But I think there, um, I think they have other opportunities. I don't want to speak for them, so that's why I think it would be good to work uh, with staff and uh, the Film Institute maybe over the next week. You know, I'm looking at the aerial, and you can, apparently the Film Institute built a very nice addition in the back, and I see on the aerial, you can come down Central Avenue, and there's a sidewalk there. I would think uh, that's a logical place to drop somebody off. That would be right there, and then there is the parking that Chris spoke about. So those are some of the things I think we could look at with the township staff and with the Film Institute. Thank you, Mr. Burson. 
Um, uh, Commissioner Whelan. Yeah. Can we just hear the motion again? I want to make sure I'm. Yep. Mr. President Bernheim, do you mind reading back in? Well, I, I oh, sorry, we sorry, uh, Mr. Durbin, sorry, Mr. Durbin is on the floor. My, my, my apologies. I, um, I think what I said was that I, I think the motion was that there, they had to develop some kind of access for uh, patrons of the Bryn Mawr Film Institute to the parking lot um, during construction. You know, you said reasonable access. Right, right. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, if that means like you know, put a priority on getting that roadway done before rather than after everything else, you know. But 18 to 22 months to have it blocked off just seems like really unfair to people. As a point so, of order, we need a specific motion to we, we, vote we on. And I thought, and Commissioner Derby, correct me if I'm wrong, the last time that I heard before is you were requesting that there be access for patients who were disabled and elderly. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. And right. I mean, and, and the, the problem is, as I understand it, it requires it to go through private property potentially. And that is what makes this difficult. And why I said, I don't know that we can be specific here this evening, but that's what I thought the motion on the table was. Okay. And our that, that's township have, secretary that's is nodding. Yes. And, and, and Jody is nodding as well. I so. can read to you what I had typed yes. up. Um, so I had. Right motion to add a condition to provide reasonable access for elderly and disabled patrons of the Bryn Mawr Film Institute during construction. Okay. So and, and this amendment to condition 42 is what you said. No, 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 no that, that was the original Bernheim, so motion. We have, we're dealing with Commissioner Mr. Durbin's motions on the current floor. motion. Which so, is, so I guess my clarification there is access to, is, you know, access is not defined. Um, I fully support the, uh, I think what I think the idea of this motion is. Um, and I think there are a lot of different ways. I'm okay with an absolute because I think there are a lot of different ways to achieve it, even through an agreement to do valet or a shuttle or something like that. So if, uh, Commissioner Durbin, if you're okay not limiting your motion to access to parking right there, but to allow uh, the developer and staff to require developer and staff to come up with a solution that does provide elderly and handicapped individuals to, you know, kind of access to the front of the building. Again, uh, regardless of how that's done, any kind of, again, shuttle or valet or anything of that sort, um, then I would support that. I don't know if Commissioner Durbin would consider that a friendly amendment. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think the important part is the access for people. And, you know, having had an elderly father live with me for years, I remember how far it is to walk places when you're not young and spry. So um, that's my point. So I would accept what you said as a friendly amendment. Okay, okay so uh, Commissioner Whalen, can we please have an edit, a specific edit to, to Jody's wording? <laughs> so can, can, can I have a friendly amendment? Okay. Yep. Um, Commissioner, I recommend approval. Oh, okay. So while he's doing that, is there any other comment I need to Sorry, she, us? <laughs> Ms. Kelly had a different amendment of, about PennDOT, and so I was getting very confused. <laughs> okay. okay, so, 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 so where like we were going. So, so in the interest of experience, any other commissioner comments? Because I'm going to want to bring this to a vote very soon. Um, yeah, I guess as long as we leave it actually a sort of undefined access. Okay. It doesn't have to be specific to parking okay. or anything else. I Great. Think that okay. Doesn't. So it was never defined specifically in the first place. It's still not defined. Right. Okay. Uh, Commissioner O'Neill. Thanks. Thank you. I think it is a little bit dangerous to kind of pigeonhole us into a parking scheme where people who don't require ADA end up using the same parking lot and taking those spaces that should have been for access for people who have needs mobility needs um so i don't know what the regulations are for x number of ada spots in that back lot if it's not being if it's on a drop-off situation so i'm not clear as to how this uh, this will make it any easier for people dropping off the three-point turning to get back to a regular parking space and uh, logistically i don't see how it works or is it just an ada parking lot now i don't know just something to think about. I'm not 
sure how it plays out. Okay, okay thank you, just, Commissioner O'Neill. Just to respond to that, I, I, I so so I'm I, I not going to. We're not going to have. Let's not have responses and questions and responses, please. Um, so the the uh, trying trying to reel this back in just a little bit. Um, so so we have a motion. Uh, it is Commissioner Durbin's motion. Um, uh, any other comments on it? Can we have it read once more? Please? Yeah, I was going to ask you to read it once more, please. Motion to add a condition to provide reasonable access for elderly and disabled patrons of Bryn Mawr Film Institute during construction. Okay. Uh, so all in favor of that uh, proposed amendment, please raise your hand. I got one, one two, two, three, three four, four, five, six. Did I get that right, Judy? I thought I counted seven. Can we okay, do so it again? Sorry, can we, can we please raise your and hand? Can everybody again? make sure, like, please put your hands near your face because somebody's mm -hmm. hands are, like, off the screen. <laughs> Thank you. Next. Yep. Okay. Opposed? One, two, three. What's that like? Seven? Okay. Yep. So so that, that motion does not. I'm going to turn to President Bernheim at this point. Right, so I, I will move to amend uh, condition 42 to add that during construction, the applicant shall work with the township and Bryn Mawr Institute in order to minimize disruption to to the to the institute and to provide uh, access for its patrons. Second. Hang on, I'm writing this down. Okay. Um, any commissioner uh, comments? Uh, commissioner Stevenson. Uh, on this amendment, you mean? Yes, please. Oh, never mind. I withdraw. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry. Any any comments on this amendment, Commissioner Durbin? I, I would just call it Bryn Mawr Film Institute, not just Bryn Mawr Institute. Oh, uh, <laughs> there, there, a friendly event. Okay, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, any other commissioner comment? Um, so, so I will add that, that I I do share some of my colleagues' nervousness about the shell work with, um, and uh, I trust that this will be a constructive working with because. As Commissioner Durbin very correctly said, uh, you know, getting a Brimmer Health, a Brimmer Film Institute through the construction transition healthy in a healthy form is extremely important uh, to the township and to Brimmer. Um, and I appreciate everyone's goodwill and constructive working uh, on that. Um, any other comments? Uh, we'll call a vote on that motion. All those in favor of President Bernheim's motion, motion, please raise your hand. Okay, any opposed? Okay, uh, so we will include that uh, in the motion. So now comments on this uh, all together. Um, now, Commissioner Stevenson. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, so I will probably surprise um, the attorney representing the developer where I won't, this is not about schooling um, and about the number of, of kids that's gonna come out of this. But it is, I'm going to talk about traffic. Um, and particularly, um, my concern is, and the chair may cut me off because it's, it's bigger than this development, it's as we are continually have growing developments on the main line down Lancaster Avenue, we're having these isolated studies about traffic, and particularly the traffic about car patterns and about traffic and during the morning and the afternoons and about pedestrian needs. I think that there needs to be a more comprehensive conversation about the impact of this growing development and how it's going to impact um, not only ridership, but particularly pedestrians um, and, and walkability. Um, and so we spent all this time talking about the Bryn Mawr Institute and making sure the people in, are able to have access to this, this, this historical place. We have to equally talk about everyday people who walk through our town, walk up and down our streets, across our streets. What are we doing to make sure that we maximize their safety? So I ask that that as a, as a body, as a staff, that we take that in consideration moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Stevenson. Uh, any other commissioner uh, comments? 
Thank you, Commissioner Zoff. Thank you, Commissioner Sinai. Uh, I'll start out with um, response to public comment. Um, uh, Mr. Barron spoke about the unoccupied commercial establishment on uh, Lancaster Avenue that is adjacent to this proposed development. Uh, uh, it, is a, uh, it is in poor condition. It is a site that uh, I have had conversations with uh, our building and planning director, Chris Leswing. He's well aware of it. Uh, and the township is uh, enforcing codes. Uh, that's the extent of what the township can do. If a property owner chooses to not occupy their commercial property, that is their private property right. It is very unfortunate. Um, with regard to trees, um, it has already been discussed in other conversations, primarily with the Bryn Mawr Civic Association, about the need for trees to be planted along Lancaster Avenue at lot seven, which is the main lot in the middle of Bryn Mawr that was just referred to in the discussion about parking for the Film Institute. But uh, along Lancaster Avenue, there are a number of trees that uh, have reached the end of their life. Some have been removed, some are going to be removed, and so that's an ideal location to at least plant some trees. Um, but uh, to the main feature tonight, um, this site of of, so of, of all the sites for large development in this township, this is one of the best. The train line, there are two train lines that are walkable. Across the street is a library, down the street is the Bryn Mawr Village with its restaurants and shops and with the Film Institute. And just a couple blocks away is Bryn Mawr Hospital. It is walkable, it is an ideal place to have a multifamily development with stores and restaurants at grade. And in fact, that was identified in the Bryn Mawr Master Plan uh, that is now some 12 years old. It is still a living document. It is still our roadmap for central Bryn Mawr. And a, a development of this type is um, part of the, what's recommended and, and, and uh, incorporated into the Bryn Mawr Master Plan. Uh, this is a large building, there's no question about it. Um, but it is a site that uh, is got uh, dated buildings. Uh, there's no storm water. Um, there's nothing active at grade. So it is not at all pedestrian friendly today. Uh, what's proposed not only will have wide sidewalks and be pedestrian friendly, but public gathering space is an essential component to this proposal, which uh, was talked about during tentative sketch, if you'll recall, about making sure that that public gathering space is clearly identified and easily um, uh, used by members of the public, and that uh, is, is essential. Um, it is a prime intersection in Bryn Mawr, uh, uh, and the, um, it, this proposed development will be significant in, in, the, in the development of Bryn Mawr, uh, complying not only with the Bryn Mawr Master Plan, but with the Bryn Mawr Village Zoning Code. There's just a partial waiver of the Natural Features Code. Every other aspect of this proposal complies with the Zoning Code. Um, there is underground parking. Um, there is compliance with the architectural standards in the Bryn Mawr Village Zoning Code, with the greening standards in the Bryn Mawr Village Zoning Code. There's a list of sustainability, sustainability features. Uh, and the shared driveway, it will remove a curb cut from busy Bryn Mawr Avenue. So instead of having two entrances very close together for commercial and residential, there'll be one. And that's actually more pedestrian friendly and better for traffic control. Um, and so this proposal has come a long way from once it was from its, from the, its initial proposal. Uh, the developer has been uh, working closely with the community, with the staff, um, uh, and what, what's before us today is a proposal for, for the middle of Bryn Mawr that makes a lot of sense and I support it and I hope my colleagues will as well. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Zoloff. Um, 
uh, I, I will just briefly comment myself and won't repeat the things that you said uh, eloquently, though I want to underscore one thing that you said, which I think is incredibly important, uh, which is you know, we have a fair amount of growth in multifamily in this township. Uh, in this particular property is the right way to do it. It's in the right place. It is exactly if we're going to have multifamily in the township where we should put it. Uh, if we are having ex excess of growth in multifamily, it's because it is not of the quality standards that we are hoping to achieve in the township, and it's not in the location where it provides a great benefit to the township. This one is a, a quality development in a really excellent location for walkable, uh, uh, you know, modern downtowns. Uh, I'll also note, uh, and just thank staff and, and the applicant, uh, this is one of those projects that I think that really improved over the course of the process that went through. It was a lengthy process. Uh, Commissioner Zeloff mentioned one of those things, which is a public gathering space, which I think has improved a lot in visibility and access. Uh, this is a property that does not look as massive as it did when it first arose because the developer took into account the comments of the Planning Commission to lighten the color and recede the top floor. So it's not as visually overbearing. The streetscape has improved. The access in, uh, uh, for, for car pull-offs has improved. It's been improved in any number of ways. Uh, and I think that is a tribute to the process that it's gone through in the constructiveness uh, of all parties involved. Uh, any other commissioner uh, comments? Seeing none, I'll call vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. As amended. As amended, As amended. yes, yes. Okay, any opposed? One uh, abstentions. Hey, Commissioner Stevenson, will you be okay if this goes on consent? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so that passes. So, so we move on to item number five on tonight's agenda, which is on page sixty-five of our packet, uh, which is a preliminary land development plan for one twenty-one East City Avenue, Valakinwood Shopping Center. Uh, and Jillian, this is you again. Okay, thank you. I turn to Jillian Dirk. Yes to both. So as you mentioned, this is a preliminary land development application for the Bally Kinwood Shopping Center. Um, for those not familiar, the Bally Kinwood Shopping Center is located um, at the intersections of Belmont and City Avenue. Um, it has frontage on St. Asaph's Avenue, St. Asaph's Road, as an access from Conchalk and State Road as well. Um, the applicant's proposing the demolition of the existing Lord and Taylor structure located on the property. It's outlined right here. And construction of a six story building containing 15,000 square feet of retail space located at ground level, 222 dwelling units, and 240 parking spaces in structured parking, as well as installation of internal drives and streetscape improvements. Um, a little bit of background on this project. Um, the applicant received tentative sketch plan approval in February of 2021 and also s received conditional use approval to exceed the maximum lot width permitted, deviate from the multi-purpose path standards, and also deviate from the building code configuration standards to not provide a building step back. Uh, since, since you saw the tentative sketch plan, the, uh, um, the plan has been revised. Um, to um, add an approximately 500 square foot commercial structure located right here. The North Drive access has been relocated. It was previously located um, to the back of North Drive. It has been moved up closer to City Avenue. Um, the surface parking lot that was um, previously located behind um, the future Block 2 development has been removed and green space has been added. And crosswalks and paths have been added to connect this development site to um, the adjacent mid-block um, cut through on the site that is located right here between the existing ACME and, the, and, the, and other retail uses. Um, this is the applicant's master plan, which shows future development of both block one and block two, which are not being proposed at this time. 
One of the major recommendations that staff has included is, um, and was supported by the township engineer, was to install a traffic signal um, located at the intersection of CLID and St. Asaph's, the area that is outlined or highlighted right here. Um, this improvement has been included as a um, recommended condition of approval. I can just provide a little more background to that. As we know, as City Avenue is developing, one of the key um, elements of City Avenue is making smaller pedestrian scale blocks. The, uh, one of the key elements of that is how do you get across those blocks now? As um, somebody just mentioned at the last, um, with the Bryn Mawr application, it's really hard to walk back when you have very long blocks back to, the, back to an intersection to cross the street. So you want to make the logical place where people can go. Um, this, where this traffic light is going to go, and we're really commending the applicant for working for us to get in at this stage of the development, will really open up the Balakinwood neighborhood as a walk shed to be able to walk into the shopping center. Right now, it's very difficult to cross over St. Asos Avenue. When this project started over two years ago, um, staff, Commissioner McComb, I think back then we had even had former Commissioner Manos was involved in this, um, met with many of the neighbors. Balakinwood has a very um, active um, neighborhood group and many of the people in Sutton Terrace, some of the other larger apartment buildings, staff met with them. We talked to them and what we heard was they, they can support the new development in City Avenue. They understand it, but they would like to participate in the amenities. If they couldn't cross St. Asaph's Avenue, it didn't work for them. So putting this traffic signal in now really opens that up for all of those older apartment buildings that are on um, St. Asaph's Avenue to cross. And then just by way of um, something that I think is really interesting, you know, as part of City Avenue, we're seeing a lot of these new multi-use paths. There's already a very long multi-use path that extends from Concha Hawkins State Road out to where Lord and Taylor is today. Those multi-use paths will extend along St. Asaph's Avenue to Belmont Avenue and then up to almost to City Avenue as part of this application. These are great amenities for anybody in Balakinwood. Being able to cross over a Clid Road where this intersection is really provides, this is all very walkable from all of these homes in here. And I've shown this green line. This is also the bikeway that we're planning at the Main Wine Greenway. This is easy biking to get over to here. And with a signalized intersection, it's going to be safe. This map that I'm showing you is a working map the staff has been working on to coordinate the different development that's happening in City Avenue. We've, we've taken the liberty of, of plugging in what we've anticipated with the tentative sketch from the Tishman property, what we anticipate coming in with the redevelopment of the GSB property to make sure that all of these things line up. We're spending that extra time with these developers to make sure when they come in, not only are we getting development, but we're getting development that's, that maximizes itself by connecting to, with each other. Um, Making these mid-block crosswalks is important because there's probably going to need to be a series of them in City Avenue. Recently, um, as two, three years ago, on Presidential um, Boulevard, there's a mid-block crosswalk put in up here that connects over. This has helped with the three-lane configuration and it's worked very, very well. Another thing that I'm showing here in City Avenue that's important is we're anticipating a roundabout coming in at the intersection of Belmont Avenue and St. Asaph's Avenue. This is a very important um, intersection. It's been on PennDOT's list to improve over the years. It's something that we've been collecting money for with many of the off-site traffic improvements with City Avenue. And in the last year, we've become aware that PennDOT, instead of having a large intersection with a lot of turning lanes, is going to pursue a roundabout design. So now we're incorporating that into future plans for this to make sure that that seamlessly works. What we don't want to do with, that, with all that traffic at the intersection is put all the pedestrians at the intersection. I think that's something we just talked about at the last application. Take the, take the pedestrians away from where the cars are, and that's why this traffic signal is so important um, going forward. So we've been, we've been working on that, and we think it's um, really great. So do you want to take us through the rest of the film? Yes. We have a number of slides showing the proposed architecture and um, renderings the applicant has provided. Um, this is the uh, front of the building where the retail space is located. Um, this would be uh, a view from the corner of Belmont and City Avenue, a kind of zoomed in view of it. Um, this is the existing Acme building right here. Um, this is a corner 
again another view as though you were on the uh, City Avenue frontage looking in. Um, as you as you turn around the building, this is a view from um, St. Asaph's, looking at the residential entrance to the building. Um, a closer view of that, and this is another um, zoomed in view of some of the retail space provided along the front of the site. Um, staff is recommending two changes to the conditions. Um, one would be, both are shown here. One would, um, a, for condition 21, the change requires, um, includes the City Avenue Special Services District as um, a participant working with staff and the applicant to program the green space located adjacent to the intersection of St. Asaph's and Belmont as public, public gathering and recreation space. Um, the second change includes a condition that the applicant submit the required $3,000 per dwelling unit fee minus any credits for on-site recreation area provided. So again, we are looking for a recommendation on the preliminary plan. This okay, thank you, Jillian. Um, <clears throat> any, any questions? Uh, for for staff, I also know that we have a representative applicant here, uh, Commissioner Grimes. Well, actually, one or two. No, go ahead. Well, I actually have a question for the, the applicant, if if that's appropriate. Yeah, that's, that's certainly and appropriate. And I'm going to do my best to to phrase this. It may sound a little facetious, but I don't mean it that way. Um, realizing that we're not regulating design today, the specifics. When we just saw the pictures here, to the uneducated eye, this building looks exactly like the Luxor and the Delwyn. Um, is there a particular reason why these buildings all look the same? I'm George Prosman. Yes. I'm the I understand that you're not the, the, the for the applicant. I, I don't know if we think they all look the same, but maybe. Uh, I'm going to have John Chitterer from Federal yeah. Realty I, I, I address will, you. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, it's going to be a tag team and, they and, and, and let me say first I understand this may be beyond the scope of what we're doing tonight but I, it's a question I have people have asked my constituents have asked me so I'm curious about that so uh, before they do I uh, I would note that the ordinance does have specific design standards and I heard on some other applications or uh, one other where we actually sought a uh, conditional use to not follow them. The Planning Commission said, we like the way your building looks. And I guess my point is, there's so many standards here yeah, that a lot of the buildings have to follow those. So there are some similarities. Yeah, no, I understand. I'll let these mm -hmm. guys yeah. give you the Please. Yeah, and, and please stuff. introduce yourself. Sure. Good evening. My name is John Chitterer. I'm a Senior Vice President with Federal Realty Investment Trust. And we're the applicant. So it's a great question. And, and in design, it's subjective. But I would argue that the design is quite frankly very different than what the Lexor did. Lexor is a very singular looking building, certain height, simple parapet, um, not a very dynamic piece of architecture, if you will, where I'm gonna have Neil Liebman give you some of the dynamic nature of what we're proposing here. And it's significantly different and we think gonna be a really significant um, building edifice, both on the property and on the horizon in the community. So I'll let Neil give some more sure. color to the architecture. Thank you. Uh, my name is Neil Liebman, as John said. I am uh, principal at Bernardin Architects. We prepared the plan. We were not the architects for the Luxor. Actually, we were the architects for your last project yeah, as well. I was just using the Luxor by example. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I think that um, one of the things that we wanted to do with this project per our client's request is something a little bit different. They own the Delwyn right, right down the road. It's more of a brown, earthy tone type project. We're looking for a different market sector or, or different design elements, something a little bit more edgy, a little bit more dynamic. So I think in, in what John had mentioned about your ordinance, your ordinance requires quite a bit of architectural relief, massing relief, roof line relief, those things. Those are all in this project, and I think that we've done that very successfully. Um, unfortunately, the images that you're showing on the screen, they don't look as dynamic as if I showed you on my own little computer or the actual renderings. The coloring on the screens are really not great, but they're very dynamic. Um, the, the architecture, uh, we, we've spent a lot of time with architecture going back and forth. 
Uh, we changed the architecture along St. Asphus uh, specifically mm -hmm. to break up the roof lines a little bit. Um, the architecture along um, City Line and with the shopping center is more in line with what's happening with the shopping center itself. So I think architecturally speaking, uh, as an architect, I think the, the, the architecture is very appropriate and it will be very dynamic when it's finished. And I think that um, if you look at some of the streetscape, so there's a lot of harmony in the design between what happens at the street level versus what happens above there. Um, so I think in combination of all those things, architecture is not just the building. It's also about the hardscapes, the streetscapes, and everything else surrounding it. Okay, so thank you for the answer. I just have one other question, uh, Mr. Chitterer. This may be better for, for you. Um, I noticed that when I go by the building, there's a for lease sign uh, that's been on the building for quite a while. Do you have a particular extended time frame for this work uh, once it gets approved? Or, um, or is, is, you know, just because usually we don't see for, for rent signs on buildings that are underdeveloped. As, as an income producing organization, we're always trying to try to find if there's an income stream, even in vacant buildings. So we have complete control of the Lord and Taylor premises. So they're in violation of their contract. We have it back, we have complete control. We go through the approval process here. We see ourselves breaking ground after the final land development plan, probably within four or five months after that. So I would suggest this time next year, we'll be under construction. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Grimes. Uh, Vice President Gavin. Great, thank you, Chairman Sinai. A um, couple of questions. One is, uh, Jillian, you mentioned a, like a 500 square foot retail kind of separate building. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, that seems like just this little small thing dropped in the middle of this. Can you explain that a little bit? And what, or maybe this is for the applicant and not for you, but what, what's the intention behind that? I think, yeah, I think John is, um, yeah, you can, yeah, 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 yeah. So, again, a great question is we're trying to inform everyone of the pieces of the plan. If you look at a variety of our mixed-use projects, we do this in all of our mixed-use type of projects. And what it is, pop-up retail. 500 square feet, 800 square feet. It's the vignette of opportunity for small type tenants, be it a coffee shop, ice cream, bakery, um, those kinds of varieties that add to the mix of the retail at the property. We found them to be very successful in terms of adding a unique public gathering place. There's a, it's on a, what we're calling the, right now the corner park. So it's a small building that adds um, interest to the corner. And, and by the way, the intersection of the north, east, west, and south, that is going to be an important intersection when blocks one and two come forward. And so that corner park will be an important public gathering space that will have a piece of, of um, hopefully beneficial retail component to it. So that's okay. the premise behind it. With the location, is that going to cause any problems between cars and pedestrians and, you know, w since it's not connected to the building? Uh, no, we don't see that. I mean, it's, it's, we believe it's set off the, from the curb line an appropriate amount of distance. I don't know if we have that image in the site plan in your, in your deck of images. Um, When you see it in a, in a, in a larger scale, mm -hmm. it's a very really small, insignificant, one-level structure. And so it's going to have some compelling architecture, uh, it's going to be inviting, and it's going to fit on the corner, we think, in a very comfortable way. And frankly, the, the, the most important part of the corner is the gathering place. One of the gathering places is part of the planning principles that we've been working with with staff since the very beginning. So that corner is an important gathering place, one of the three or four gathering places that are being proposed. And so we want to accentuate it and actually draw more attention to it by offering a retail component. So that's what that. So that just so I understand, the gathering place is connected to that building. Yeah. Or if you if you see the, the again the, the curve, red line. That, that curve. <laughs> the yeah, it, it's all it's all around. It's like the, the whole corner, if you will, is the corner park, for lack of a better term. Okay. Right? So it's a park place that happens to have a structure. You see it in downtown Center City, Philadelphia. I mean, there's examples of it downtown um, but where you have this small little retail vignette building. Okay. No, I was trying to understand that. Yep. The, the next question, Jillian, um, 
You talk about condition amending condition 53 being the 3,000 less credit for on-site recreation area. If I read the memo correctly, that on-site recreation area is a temporary space until the next pro, uh, phase of this comes in. Is that correct? So there is some on-site recreation space that the applicant's providing in addition to the, the space that um, is the green space that's located at the corner of St. Asaph's and Belmont, including the pool that's adjacent. Um, the recreation area is for the use of the residents. So we are looking a little bit clo more closely at that, but I believe Chris will speak about the green space proposed at the corner. Yeah, Jillian, Jillian's absolutely correct. So there are some spaces that meet the, the standards of the, of the subdivision code for on-site recreation. That's that pool area in the back. It's relatively flat, and that's actually what's intended for in the, in the code. Um, in conversations with the applicant, that area that you indicated is, is temporary is actually they've decided to make that permanent. And, they, and this condition, the new condition, makes that permanent. And then it also, um, we're going to work with the City Avenue Special Service District and staff and maybe in Parks and Rec to find a way what that space could be. We can't figure it out since they offered it up. It was something that, honestly, Jillian kept pushing that, you know, we didn't really want it to be temporary. It is, really has a lot of value to the community. But we do need a process to design it. One of the things that we've, I will mention, you know, Commissioner um, Lacombe and I and, and Jillian have been to a lot of meetings with neighbors. Anything that's done there, we want to work with everybody and come up with a design process. This is going to be under construction for a couple years, but it's a great opportunity to make a real node here for, for space. If anybody's walked along those trails along the back that's currently there where the Delwyn is, it's actually a nice trail. You walk over from the Kinwood, where the Kinwood Trail is extending, you walk along the back. The Delwyn is, is private. You're walking by, people have their chairs and have barbecues. And, it'd be, and many times we've heard, well, wouldn't it be great if we could stop? Well, by creating this space permanently, it makes a spot along that pathway that people can stop along these areas that's actually semi-public um, as well. What do you mean semi-public? Well, it'll be, um, it'll, it will be owned by the applicant, right. but the applicants agreed um, by this condition to um, have it open to the public. So recreation area, when it's put in, is really only for the use of people who live in the buildings that's there. It's meant to serve them. Here, this area will be developed that it's for those residents, but also for the larger district itself. Can you show where on the map that is? That's not the same place we were just talking about, is it? No. Or, okay. No, this is a whole other one. Right. There are a lot of, well, Jillian's pulling that up. There are all, um, just, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of linear feet of new trails coming in here, um, gathering spaces. Um, you don't really appreciate it at this scale. You know, at staff level, we've been looking at these much closer. Um, but in the back here, yeah, that's good. That's good. This actually shows when it was parking still. So it's this area in the back here at the intersection of St. Asaph's and Belmont Avenue. One of the previous slides that Jillian just had that was in our deck showed that being parking. We've gradually worked with the applicant to not have that be surface parking, to have it be green, and now we're going to have it to be permanent green space that's actually available to use by the public. Okay. Well, kudos to you, Jillian. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, the next question I had was about um, the traffic study. There was something in the memo how the supplemental traffic study talked about um, it was only one, one morning rush hour and one afternoon rush hour. It said uh, the TE review noted that the analyses were based on a limited amount of traffic count information and only evaluated a single weekday morning peak hour and a single weekday afternoon peak hour. This is obviously a huge development. This is a, an area where traffic has been a huge concern. Why, why are we seeing such a limited traffic study? That's an excellent question. Uh, and the, um, <clears throat> the traffic, the, the, the AM, PM peak that was, uh, that was analyzed was specific for the traffic signal warrant analysis at the intersection of CLID and, uh, and the site access. Mm -hmm. or, uh, in, in conversation with the applicant and with, the, with their engineer, we're asking <coughs> that to be expanded for a number of reasons. One, it didn't take into account you know, the future development of the other blocks on the site, and it d also didn't take into account uh, uh, adjustments for background traffic for the planned uh, you know, f potential future projects for the district. Uh, we, we, the, you know, the, 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 the warrant analysis was close, 
uh, for, for volume, um, and we feel that, uh, that when, when that is expanded, that we, that we would be able to have a successful warrant analysis that we can go to PennDOT and, and warrant a signal and get a signal approved for that intersection. Okay, so if, if I'm understanding it correctly, the traffic analysis that was done may or may not allow, or may or may not convince PennDOT to allow us to put a traffic light, but we think that if we expand this, that we have a much better shot at getting a traffic light in here. Is that correct? Precisely. Okay, and that's in the conditions that we will be doing another traffic or a building on that traffic study? That's correct. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and the, the last question I have, um, before when the architect was talking about the, this project and comparing it to the Dell one from Commissioner Grimes' questions, um, he said it's a different market, it's a different sector. Who is the, who's the target market, who is the sector, and how does that compare to the Dell one? Just curious what that meant when he, when he had mentioned that. The, the Delwyn is at um, stabilization, so I think we're about 96% occupied. It's been an interesting start, building through COVID, leasing up through COVID. But the response in the market and the residents um, has been phenomenal. So it, it really was a, a, an 87 unit building, um, different size units than what's being proposed for the current phase two piece of it right here. So the market is the general market. I mean, it, it, it's leased under the, the, the Fair House Administration rules and regs and the, the, the ability for, for the market to uh, come to it based on the size of the units and the amenities in an amenity-rich building compared to Delwyn, that will be the distinction in the market between the two. And there's competition as well. Wait, so you said it's the same market and then you said it, it's a different market. No, no, because, well, it's a different market because of the, with the amenities that are in this building compared to the Delwyn. We don't have a pool, smaller workout room. Is this, this is a higher, richer, we have the courtyard in this one. This is a rich, it's okay. called amenity rich, if you will, okay. um, compared to the Delwyn. All right, thank you. Yeah. Those are all my questions, thank you. Okay, thank you, Vice President Gavin. Uh, Commissioner McComb. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Sondheim. Um, yeah. Commissioner Julian, uh, could you comment a little bit, and I know that there have been some changes in terms of the green recreational space, but maybe some of the options that will be available for the township or the applicant in terms of usage of this. You know, I, I think at one of the meetings with neighbors, somebody said, well, we don't, you know, we don't want more playing fields because of traffic, and, but this isn't going to be a soccer field, but if you could describe a little bit about some of the usages, such as maybe a community garden or something along those we lines. Had We've had very preliminary discussions with the applicant, but I, I do think that a community garden would be one of those things. We, we, we're going to bring in, working with the City Avenue Special District, a study of what works in City Avenue. We want this to work for the district, right? This is a community space. We're seeing a lot of private development, and we, we see this as that opportunity to kind of be that civic green where everybody can come together. So we're going to actually, what we'd like to do is have a sort of a design process with this and be able to bring in the different people, because there's going to be concern. I know there's going to be concerns about overuse, there's going to be access to underuse. Who lives there? How can we do that? But some of the options we talked about were a community garden, um, just simple gathering areas, exercise places along the trail. It's, it's only a quarter, um, it's about half an acre um, in itself, um, third to a half an acre. Um, it doesn't really lend itself, it, it, it couldn't really be a, a ball field or anything like that, but it's going to be designed um, more highly intensely. You're going to have things like walls and plantings and put all of that in. Um, so it could be things that, that we certainly want to be able to draw things to the people that live just outside of the district and people that live inside the district and people that live at this building. But a community garden is one of those things that we thought that could be an easy thing to do in there. Um, whatever it is, it's going to be very green and it's going to connect to those bike paths that connect to the whole rest of the township. Great. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Commissioner McComb. Uh, Commissioner Courtney. Thank you, Commissioner Sinai. Uh, I'd like to ask the applicant about Condition 54. Uh, this is a, picking up on the conversation we had uh, back in February. Condition 54 is about incorporating green technology. I'd like to hear uh, what, what your plan is so far. So under the sustainability objectives for the investment, we're going to achieve a USGBC LEED Silver certification. And I mentioned that, frankly, before in the previous uh, approval process meeting. And we're going to stay with that standard, and we're working, designing, and then building to those standards. So we're excited about that. Um, there's a variety of things that go into that energy management modeling, the electric voltaic uh, vehicles, EV uh, uh, stations. Um, we had originally proposed six. Staff asked us to put in 11, and we've agreed to 11. Um, so we're increasing the, the, the amount of sustainable practices and then operation of the property 
in a way that we feel really good about. Will there be an on-site solar array? There will not be on-site solar. So in your 2020 corporate responsibility brochure, mm -hmm. it says Federal Realty invested $37.5 million in on-site solar arrays. Why can't we have that? Um, those buildings where the solar has been and it's been on the ground and has been on the buildings. The buildings are metal, steel, and concrete structure will support the loads of that. And then the, the wood may support the system here, but it's not part of the program for this building. Okay. And then your brochure also talks about uh, your lead gold buildings and how you've invested $1.2 billion in lead certified buildings. I'm, I, it's great that you have a lead silver. Thank you for committing to that. Uh, why not go for more? So I'll say on the record, we're, we're designing to try to hit gold standard. I can't commit to it okay. because there's a cost impact that has to be wrestled with. So, so we, if we could achieve gold, we're going to, to achieve gold, but I can't commit to it. But we're going to achieve silver uh, guaranteed. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Courtney. Any other commissioners with questions? Uh, I, I have a couple actually before you before you okay. sit down. So, so one thing that Chris alluded to that, that I want to follow up on, especially now that we've got the green space, um, how do you see the traffic patterns and the pedestrian patterns connecting with the other sites? With the rest of the center? No, from your center to the neighboring properties, right? Because Chris was talking about the conversations about integrating across the district. So that, that is, in fact, a great question, and it's been the core part of the planning exercise from the onset. So when we first met, with staff, Chris and Jillian and Carissa, uh, and then meet with, met with the communities. <clears throat> the whole narrative around connectivity, walkability, they become common used terms, but there's a real impact and change that's happening at this property. And it started with Delwyn, as Chris noted. So we're building off of the Del Delwyn success. And in this property, we're adding multiple multi, Chris mentioned lots of linear feet. I'm not sure how many, but there's a lot of linear feet, a multi-purpose path. We've expanded the sidewalk on the face of the new building up to 27 feet, um, which is a significant um, benefit to the public domain and the public realm. We've added the corner park. We have the other vignette parks. We now have the meadow, which is going to become part of the public domain on private property. So the building of the walkability and the connectivity on the property extends to the outside, extends to Keystone, extends across the city avenue, extends over to the to the Tishman Spire property, extends over to the, the, the summit, I think is the name, I may have missed that, Harris. Um, and it extends to the neighborhood. And so to the extent people walk, ride bikes, it's all accessible. To the extent that people want to drive cars and don't shop and want to go to the meadow, it's a, it's a parking lot and they can park there. So all those amenities are building on the, the objective of connectivity. Okay, and as we, as we move through the phases, do you envision the, the buildings that come in as you know, the, the, the portions that face to the outside of the, the development rather than just the inside corner uh, as being, you know, also, you know, attempting to have the same sort of streetscape or are you concentrating on the- I'm purpose? sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. So okay, sorry. Uh, louder, Is that better? Yeah, that'll be okay. louder, that's all. Yeah, so, 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 you know, one of the things that you, you changed along the process is that the side of the building facing St. Asaph's, right, uh, that that side changed, right? You changed how that looked. Um, as you go through the development, do you view the focus of the pedestrian streetscape being internal to the site or facing the neighboring sites, or how do you envision balancing that? I don't, I don't need a long answer, just how are you thinking about building that out? Sure, the, the, I mean, the, 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 the nature of the urban grid, if you will, the blocks one, two, and three, and actually we talked with Chris and Jillian about this earlier today, there's an extension of that grid coming in the future as more control of the site is gained. And so the, 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 the nature of the urban grid is going to expand over time, but for now it's blocks one, two, and three, right? And, and, and frankly, one of the most important parts is what's happening on the sidewalk. Street retail, as we call it, is being introduced at this property. It's going to extend and connect to the Acme and the rest of the small shop. So that whole street environment and that public realm is going to be an important part of the vertical nature of what's coming over time, starting with this block three. And so it's going to be a evolving narrative around the public realm. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so Joe, can I, can I get you to come up for a second?
So, so I, I just wanted to follow up on Vice President Gavin's question about traffic uh, and what the, the traffic studies consider. Uh, and it's largely because Ward 12 is kind of downstream traffic-wise from this, which is you know, the traffic that comes from, you know, to and from along City Avenue ends up coming down our way towards East Wynwood, towards Lancaster. Um, and so, so you mentioned something about considering when we have the full build out, right? So there are two additional phases at least here. There's Keystone across the street at some point, is on Chris's map. There's the Tishman development. Uh, how do you think through, or, or you know, is it part of the process uh, for evaluating how that growth is going to get managed along the City Avenue corridor? Again, another great question. Uh, there, I mean, the City Avenue car does have an Act 209 study, and that is more or less a comprehensive study of the district for uh, the anticipated growth and what off-site improvements would be necessary to accommodate that traffic. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, with staff and with the applicants, we're, we, we have a number of different op uh, options. Uh, the, the one option would be for the individual projects to come in, do their traffic studies as they go, take into consideration some background traffic, and, and, and schedule on-site and off-site improvements appropriately for each project. Or comprehensively look at, a, at, at an update to the 209 study, and I think that might be the better route uh, to go. Um, so, you know, that, that's one of the things that we are considering, and we're hoping, you know, that, you know, since all of these projects are coming at the same time, that that might be the, the best path forward. This is one small, I mean, it's not a small project, but this is one cog in a much larger wheel, and, um, you know, since this is kicking off this whole process, um, we're hoping that we can, you know, there, there is, there is a longer process to get the 209 study updated, uh, but, uh, but we're, we're confident that that might be the, the best route forward. Okay, thank you. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, not the least of which is that uh, if we don't do the comprehensive approach, then any particular property developer should rush to get their project in before more onerous, you know, traffic management requirements kick in, right? So, like, better to have it be thought about holistically uh, in, in applied kind of equitably. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, any other commissioners? Questions? Okay. Um, so I'm going to, to read in the motion and then we'll take public comment. Uh, so I'm going to move that we recommend to the Board of Commissioners that they approve a preliminary land development plan as amended, um, as read in by, by, by Jillian and Chris. Uh, the plan prepared by Bowler Engineering shows de demolition of the existing Lord and Taylor building and construction of a six story building containing 15,547 square feet of retail space, 220 dwelling units and 240 parking spaces in structured parking. Uh, the plan also shows the installation of internal drives and streetscape improvements. And as Jillian and Chris mentioned, we are only considering the Lord and Taylor redevelopment. Uh, any future things on the master plan would of course be future land development proposals. Do I have a second? Commissioner McComb, thank you. Uh, public comment, so I don't have any emails in advance. Jody, is there anyone on Zoom? Yeah. Okay, does anyone in the room care to make public comment on this? Okay, seeing none, um, uh, I will turn to any uh, remaining commissioner comments. Okay, commissioner McComb. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Sondheim. I, I want to be brief because the presentations were excellent and this, this process has been sort of thoroughly gone over by the applicant staff and it's been in progress before. But this is a very big step forward for a revitalization of what could be a troublesome part of Val Kinwood with uh, the Lord Taylor going out of business. But I think one of the, the many, many things that, that commend the project, the, one of the best is the connectivity. Um, this enables people with a, uh, the signalized crosswalk, people to get across St. Asaph's from the apartment building so they can use the shopping center. There's a connection to the mainline Greenway. There's a connection to the Kenwood Heritage Trail, down to the river, the Pencoid Landing. It's all part of a master plan for Ballot Kin when it talks about connectivity, walkability, pedestrian safety. Um, I think federal has shown a long-term commitment to the area. Um, they have plans to upgrade the rest of the shopping center, which is huge. I'm very pleased that the Dell one is at 96% occupancy, which shows that uh, the market supports this, the market likes what it's seeing. So I think this is a, a, a terrific project and I would urge you all to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McCollum. Any other commissioner comments? 
Mr. Grimes. Um, thank you, and I, I apologize to Commissioner McComb because of the word commissioner. Sometimes it's like that last word, but since I just walked in. Um, I just want to commend our, our staff and the applicant um, uh, first of all, I support this. I should say I support this tonight, but I want to commend the applicant and our staff on condition number 56, um, which is the one that uh, where the applicant has agreed to, utiliz to uh, utilize an architectural salvage or deconstruction company and try and reuse and recycle uh, the building materials. Uh, as I've said in other contexts, I think this is something to, good to try and do with or require with historical properties, which we're looking into now. Uh, but seeing this in here for a non-historical property is just as good, uh, helps us with sustainability in the environment. And um, I want to thank uh, everyone involved for getting that in here, and I hope we'll see it more on other projects. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Grimes. Uh, any other commissioner comments? Okay, seeing now, I'll call the vote. All those, All in, those favor in favor of the motion, motion as, as amended, please raise your hand. Okay, uh, opposed? One, two, three opposed. Uh, any abstentions? Motion carries. So now we are going to go uh, a little out of order um, and we are going to skip ahead to item number seven, which is 525 Clother Road. And we will come back to item number six uh, uh, after that. Uh, so that puts us on page 105 of your packet. Uh, I actually have the correct page number now. Um, and so I'm just going to enter this as a, as a motion before we have a presentation. Uh, I'm going to move that we, um, hang on, do I have right here? No, I'm not right. I think that's right. Sorry. Okay. Yep. No, I'm going to move that we. Uh, uh, recommend the Board of Commissioners to uh, approve a preliminary subdivision plan dated May 3rd, 2021, uh, showing the demolition of all structures in the subdivision of the existing property into two lots. Lot one would be 26,122 square feet with a new three-story single-family detached dwelling, and lot two would be 29,383 feet and would also have a three-story single-family detached dwelling. Both will have stormwater management systems, and both lots would take access from Clother Road. Do I have a second? Uh, Commissioner Whalen, thank you. Um, and uh, Jillian. Yes, so as you mentioned, this is a preliminary subdivision plan. The property, um, the subject property is shown here, um, highlighted in red. This is Clothier Road, and right behind um, the subject property, there are single family residential homes as well as Morris Avenue and um, another road where it takes you up to Lancaster Avenue. Um, it is a single family detached home, um, and as you mentioned, they are seeking a, um, a approval to subdivide the property into two lots and to construct two new homes. Um, both lots will be accessed from Clothier Road. This is the existing structure shown to be removed, um, an image of the existing house, um, the two lots that are proposed, and then the, the location of the homes to be constructed. Um, the applicant is proposing a sidewalk to be provided along Clothier Road with walkways that extend from the proposed structures to the sidewalk. Um, the rear portion of the property is, is township floodplain, and as you mentioned, there are two new uh, stormwater management uh, systems proposed, one for each lot. Um, again, this is an image. There is an existing sidewalk that terminates at the property boundary. So located right here, there is an existing sidewalk, so this would extend that existing sidewalk along the property frontage. Um, the applicant, in response to request by staff, has increased the number of plantings to provide water quality in the rear of the property where the floodplain is located. 
Um, the applicants also provided us with renderings of the structures proposed. Staff has included some recommendations on the proposed architecture. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Jillian. Uh, any questions for Jillian by commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Whalen. Thank you, Jillian. Um, could you go back to the site plan, please? Sure. Uh, right as soon as you stop sharing. <laughs> Yeah, this one will do. The, where we're talking about the sidewalk, mm -hmm. it looks like the sidewalk at the top has a nice setback, but then as you go around the curve, the sidewalk ends up right next to the street. Um, I'm worried that this is going to create kind of a Lancaster Avenue type sidewalk, which is death defying, um, especially around a curve where, you know, anecdotally, everyone tells me that's where the, the speedway is in this neighborhood. So I was just wondering how come that doesn't have the, the kind of nice verge there and the, the standard setback? Yeah, um, great question. As you noted, there is a verge located right here along this um, portion of the property and the sidewalk. The verge terminates right here and the sidewalk abuts the, the roadway with no landscape in between. Um, there are existing trees along the property frontage, um, existing mature trees that the applicant is seeking to preserve. So the um, sidewalk was placed around those so as to not impact them. And we considered, um, we heard some comments about stormwater and runoff, and we thought um, there was a little bit of back and forth as to whether or not the tree should remain and the verge um, um, or the verge be provided. And it, it, it was the Planning Commission's recommendation that the, um, the sidewalk be where it is shown on the plan with no verge. Okay. Um, in terms of sight line or visibility, is, is that a part of your question? Yeah, and also speeds? just, you know, again, when you're walking up and down whole sections of Lancaster Avenue and you're walking literally right next to the curb yeah. line, uh, it makes it a very dangerous and uncomfortable walkability. Now, this is obviously not Lancaster Avenue, but, um, you know, and we do want to keep mature trees. Can you? Is this showing, this plan showing the mature trees? Is that the three right there? Yeah, there's one here, one here, and then there's one just off of the, um, on the adjacent property, if the sidewalk were to be extended. Okay. Um, um, and I, I agree, I, I generally always prefer a verge to be located next to a sidewalk to give a sense of comfort cool. for pedestrians yeah, absolutely. when possible. Um, and can you explain, uh, back in the rear, I saw one of the, you showed the there's a township floodplain. Yes. In the back, can you explain that for everyone? Yes, I actually will <laughs> have Joe. Um, he is a, he will probably be able to provide uh, more information. Sure. Yeah, there's a uh, township floodplain to the rear of the property, uh, and the the floodplain was established by an approximated study years ago, uh, probably based on soil conditions and maybe. A, um, you know, maybe a, a, an abbreviated engineering study, uh, but uh, you know, as, as these projects uh, come up, you know, the applicant has the ability to actually analyze the flood, do it, provide an engineering study to analyze the floodplain to more accurately depict uh, the limits of of, uh, of the 100-year flood, and that's what that's what's shown here in the blue. Uh, as a result of that study. It was a very conservative study. There is a below grade system and an above grade channel. They, ne they uh, did neglected to analyze the below grade system and just analyze what happens if that, you know, above on the surface. So uh, the extent that they're showing here is probably further than, than what would actually occur during the 100 year storm. Okay, so first, th there's no open stream or anything at the back of this property right? uh, it, may, it may be an intermittent or you know maybe some uh, I'm, I'm not sure what happens below grade in, in the storm sewer but it may be an intermittent stream uh, that flows seasonally okay so I just want to you know clarify for everyone uh, you know our one per person watching and everyone sitting up here um, okay. that this isn't like short Ridge Creek or anything like that no you? okay um, now the engineering study does that extend beyond the property boundaries? I mean, does that describe, because obviously this water has to go to somewhere and come from somewhere. You know, are they e extrapolating out? Have they actually done the engineering? How far out does this? The, the engineering study does establish boundary conditions on the downstream end. 
uh, to, uh, to 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 you know, basically start. I mean, where, where, what is our starting point? Uh, but it doesn't. But as a result of the study, it does not change the uh, floodplain conditions uh, outside the limits of the property, with the exception of the two properties that abut it to the rear. So, even though we have this, and you said from some time before, I think actually even from the '60s is when we established this. And that, just to be clear, this is a township floodplain. This has nothing to do with FEMA or any kind of federal floodplain. That's, that's correct. Right? It's unregulated by FEMA so, or the state. I mean, it seems respectfully haphazard to have the floodplain changed property by property. The, have we looked into or discussed, I don't know about what the applicant or on the township side, you know, how, mu how many properties would be affected here by looking at the entire township floodplain, at least in this It's structure. a good point. We, I mean, and I believe there, there may be other properties in the past that have, you know, along this corridor that have adjusted their floodplain. So you're right. It, it may be a little haphazard where this one's thin and then it, it reverts back to the township and then it gets skinny again for another property. But it, it, it does make sense. Uh, to, to possibly, you know, reanalyze the whole corridor and, and come up with a more accurate floodplain. And, and I guess what I'm suggesting there is something along the lines of what Commissioner Stevenson suggested with regard to traffic along Lancaster Avenue. Just we need a much more holistic view. And I, I think in development we're doing a lot of things very well and very, you know, strongly with regard to the engineering, but only in tiny little pockets as things pop up as opposed to you know, looking at the whole view here. Um, so as the township engineer, or as the um, township floodplain has been uh, revised here, do we see any issues with regard to the subdivision or the downstream problem? No. I mean, as a matter of fact, it does benefit, you know, the, the, the revisions to this floodplain does benefit the properties that abut it to the rear because, you know, whereas there was a portion of those uh, existing abutting properties that were in the floodplain, a majority of their backyards have come out of it. Oh, I see. So we've actually, even though Along we don't portion. technically go Oops. across boundary, property boundary lines, in this instance, we have gone to the abutting properties in the rear? Right. These properties. Okay. And, and then are we also having separate uh, stormwater management facilities on these sites? Right. The, the, the existing property has very limited stormwater facilities, uh, if any, the, uh, just due to the age of the, of the home and when it was developed, probably right. did, you know had different regulations. You know, our, our, these these two houses, uh, there's um, there's only a slight increase in impervious coverage uh, compared to the existing conditions, about by about a thousand square feet, and uh, they're they're fully compliant with the uh, the township ordinance for uh, flood control and stormwater management. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I would ask is with regard to, you know, having a curve here, and I can't tell what's the condition kind of going up away from the curve, are there any sight line considerations or concerns with the two new driveways? Uh, the, the applicant was required to uh, provide clear sight triangles and, and, and uh, line of sight calculations, and both driveways uh, meet those requirements. Okay. Thank you very much. Those are all my questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Whalen. Uh, Commissioner McComb. Uh, I think Commissioner O'Neill is ahead of it. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Just sure. go ahead. Okay. Um, quick, a couple of quick questions for Jillian. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the landscape plan. I think there's some good concepts here. Can, can, is the is the property sort of um, degraded in a sense? You're talking about divining existing trees and so forth. So it it looks as if it's not a particularly pristine site from an environmental. There is definitely some overgrowth along the frontage. Okay. Um, I do believe there's some material that um, can be salvaged in along the property boundary, and we've included a condition requiring that. Okay, and the others, I, 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 I think it's great that we're preserving um, existing trees. Uh, the 25 inch spruce tree, just most people know this, we're not talking about something that's 25 inches tall, it's 25 <laughs> dBH, which is diameter at breast height, so it's this big, which doesn't qualify as, as a heritage tree, but until the township has a heritage tree protection ordinance, which maybe someday it may have and probably should have, I think this is consistent with what we should be doing with a, almost a standard condition of approvals to, to preserve the existing trees like this. So I think that's a good idea to support it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Commissioner McComb. Uh, Commissioner O'Neill. 
Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Sinai. Um, back to the the stormwater um, and the area there that in flooded conditions um, would bubble up, creating a bit of a stream or um, a something that would contribute to more water in that area or potentially downstream. Um, what can we do or can we encourage the applicant to maybe think about in as we move down the pike for this development or these homes, riparian plantings or something that, you know, willow trees, big things that can really help control um, the quality of the water going through. And also for me, I'm more concerned with volume, to be honest, than I am about cleanliness. Um, but in, in any event, I think anything we can do as a landowner here, um, absent any larger scale system that we have to determine how how one neighbor treats the next neighbor treats the next neighbor with respect to water flow. It's super important um, to this process, as you know. So I would love to see us think about that if we could without mandating. It's not something we can mandate through this process, I understand, but just encourage best practices there. Um, and also uh, regarding form, to 8,200 square foot homes, that's big. Um, is this form to the neighborhood currently? And why, why so, why so big? Great questions. I can, um, the first comment about the landscaping, we, we thought the exact same thing. Um, and we actually did ask the applicant to provide additional plantings for water quality in the floodplain area. And th the, their response is, um, ha is illustrated on the plan. So they have provided additional plantings and, and we were really happy with that. That's great. Um, in terms of the size, I think possibly the applicant can speak to market. Um, what is the size of, yeah, the house. size of the houses? Please come to the microphone, introduce yourself, and then you can you can address Commissioner O'Neill's question. Thank you. My name is Jim Buckler. I represent the applicant. I think the size is, is appropriate for the market. It's actually smaller than the house that's on the site right now that's being taken down. Um, but it's not, those aren't especially large houses um, uh, for, uh, for this community, um, or certainly for this area. I'm I just, just, if I I'm, could. I'm, oh, no, you're a perfect, perfect answer. I just, I'm concerned about form. Okay. so that um, we spend a lot of time on um, creating environments that look mm -hmm. like you know um, what is around them and oftentimes what we're seeing at least in my area are infill homes or homes that have gone through subdivision but maybe look like a neighbor's house but actually is either larger in scale or too high of a roof line mm -hmm. and it ends up looking it, we're, we're not meeting the goal of, of our form-based zoning um, because we're still getting um, a lot of two in mass properties. Um, so anyway, but that is a little large, but I understand if, the, if every street, every home on the street is between seven and 10 or 11,000 square feet, right. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. I also just, just to be really more specific, as Jillian had indicated, not only did we add trees in the, but the tree, the, the, the growth that was added were just exactly the things you talked about, willows and things. Excuse me, are, I can't hear you. Yeah, if you can speak a little more loudly, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. into the microphone. I'm sorry. The, the, the trees that were added in the, in, the, in, the, in the area around the flood zone were, were specifically water um, sopping, you know, trees that took a lot of water. That was part of the plan. Um, Bern Panzak, our a landscape architect, is here if you want any questions answered specifically. Thank you so much. Yeah. Could I ask, and I, I should, I apologize, but um, I'm looking at condition number 10 that was added, and I just realized that I, I wanted to make sure I understood what that meant. Because so I'm, going, I'm going to ask you to just sort of take that you know, good. Good sidebar with staff while we, while we continue here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, okay thank I'll you, talk. Commissioner O'Neill. Um, Vice President Gavern. Great, thank you, Chairman Sinai. Um, I, I guess, Chris, maybe this is a question for you while Jillian's uh, having a conversation. In the um, Montgomery County uh, letter, it talked about that 25-inch tree um, coming down. My understanding is that's not actually the case now, and there's a condition condition uh, for the applicant shall investigate preserving the 25-inch spruce tree. Um, I, I'm concerned. What is the plan with that tree? Is it to maintain it? The, the, the idea is to maintain it to get the sidewalk around it. This is what 
um, Commissioner Whalen had originally right. identified. We're going through that balance of preserving a tree or getting the sidewalk, so I think we kind of split it half and half, move the sidewalk and preserve the tree. Okay, so should, I, I'm concerned when conditions say the applicant shall investigate doing something, there's no teeth to that. Yeah. Um, should it say the applicant shall, knowing that we're moving the sidewalk and putting it where we're putting it in the, and that's the balance you struck, um, and, and to follow up on Commissioner McCombs comments, should, should the condition say the applicant shall preserve the 25 inch instead of shall investigate preserving it? Um, I'm going to defer to the applicant because they actually have their... Is this in number 10? It's number four. I think it's number four. Yeah. Yeah. Refer, refer to number 10. So Vice President Gabbard, you, you, you basically want to delete, investigate. Correct, right? I just, just want have to say it shall preserve. preserve right. Unless there's a reason not to because it would get in the way of the sidewalk or whatever it might be. Well, I th uh, you can Bern, please introduce yourself. Thank yeah, Bern Panzak, uh, landscape architect for the applicant. Uh, we are providing a, a verge in front of lot uh, number one, and uh, we were planning to remove the 25-inch spruce. Uh, we are planning to rem to keep the uh, large uh, sycamore or London plane tree in front of lot uh, number two. There's another spruce tree that we're preserving in front of lot number two. Um, you know, another reason oh. for the, the removal of the, uh, the spruce tree uh, on lot number one is it, 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 yes, it is a large tree, and um, you know preser preservation of deciduous trees uh, lend a stateliness to neighborhoods. Uh, large evergreen trees at the street we felt were encumbering uh, the street and adding to this sense of uh, of um, lack of space, insecurity at the walkway area. Uh, we felt like, it, you know, in some ways it, it created an out of scale uh, issue uh, with the, the residential property. Um, you know, we're preserving the spruce on lot number two. It's on the side of the house. These are the reasons why we, we have suggested the removal of, uh, of that larger spruce. Uh, there's a lot of overgrowth along that street. Um, a lot of it has uh, crowded out each other and, and we simply felt, along with an arborist uh, review of, of the health and wellness of those uh, trees and, and shrub species, uh, that the best thing to do would be to refresh that streetscape at this point and that's what we were intending to do. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, Jillian, from a staff's perspective, does staff agree that it makes sense to remove that spruce tree on lot number one? I mean, our recommendation was for them to investigate preserving it. So I think that our preference is it be preserved. Okay. Because I, what I just heard from the applicant or the applicant's representative is whether it interferes with the sidewalk or not, they have no interest in preserving it. Yes. They think it's not an appropriate tree, if I, if I heard that correctly. So investigating preserving it when the applicant's saying we have no interest in preserving it, makes no sense either the either it should say they should preserve it because we think they should preserve it or just get rid of it altogether because staff is okay with getting rid of it because they agree because we agree with applicant so if if i'm hearing you right staff disagrees with what the applicant's saying and we should we should preserve it not investigate preserving it yes okay so is now an appropriate time to make a motion certainly I would like to make a motion to amend um, condition number four by, uh, it should say, instead of the applicant shall investigate preserving, the applicant shall preserve, and then everything else is the same, the 25 inch spruce tree. Um, that is, that's my motion. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, Commissioner Grimes. Um, so discussion on that motion, uh, any commissioner comments or any, questions? If, if just, so do you, would you like to yeah, yeah, just, and, and the rationale for that is staff, you know, while the applicant says this, this doesn't make sense to keep it, staff is disagreeing and says this is something that should be maintained. And if, if we feel as a township it shouldn't be maintained, I think um, the, the condition should say it shall be maintained, not shall be investigated. 
So that's that's my rationale. Okay. So, so Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you. Um, maybe a friendly amendment. Um, if it's in good health, if there's no sense in forcing a preservation of a tree if it's at its end of life. I mean, I do consider that friendly. Do you, <laughs> do you yeah. consider that friendly? I should say. Uh, do we know if it's in good health? I would defer to the applicant's landscape architect. Sorry. 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 Don't come here. We believe, we believe it to be in good health. Uh, we okay. believe it's also uh, pushing, you know, the, the upward end of its life cycle, perhaps. And uh, once it might get exposed uh, by other things being removed around it, it could present uh, in a wet uh, snowstorm uh, some possibility of uh, you know problems if there were high winds and things like that different from deciduous trees. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to uh, mention here is uh, if the preservation were to take place, uh, we would see limbing that tree up uh, pretty significantly from the street uh, to allow, uh, you know, kind of what we described as, as sort of the stately nature of a deciduous tree being limbed up as opposed to uh, having lots of uh, evergreen branches hanging down uh, at the uh, sidewalk level. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. So, so, so it was Commissioner O'Neill who asked the question. Right. So, so, sorry, was it a friendly amendment for? Do you want to keep that amendment in there? or? Yeah. Sure. I mean, it, it's then that, yeah, we don't need to keep it. Yeah. Do you, has, he's answered it. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. So do you withdraw? You, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, so Jillian, I have some questions. Are you done? Is that oh, yes, enough? Yes, okay. Yes, sorry, that's sorry. Thank, you. thank you, Commissioner Neal. Uh, I have some questions. I know you're not an arborist. Uh, so, so, so when we're looking when we're looking at this uh, plan, um, so the additional plantings that are proposed of trees, right, of deciduous trees. Uh, would you characterize them as they would be trees that would grow up to be, I guess, what I would call estate trees? Or are they going to be, yeah? I mean, I think there is a, there is a combination of deciduous and evergreen material throughout the site. Um, but I okay, so I can, I can turn it over to, yeah, to, to the applicant. No, it's okay. So, not my, uh... um, <laughs> so, so, be, 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 so, so if, if I'm going to accept your, your premise that you know, we should remove this tree that's towards the end of its life and have, you know, a, a you know, a, another set of trees are going to grow to replace it. You know, what is the tree material and what kind of scale is it going to grow to? Well, the, the street trees are of, uh, you know, a species that have uh, been approved by the uh, shade tree advisory. And, um, you know, we, we met with the shade tree commission and we talked extensively about the uh, preservation of the sycamore. Uh, I believe we uh, removed or slightly relocated the driveway in order to do that. And uh, yeah, so, you know, the, the streetscape uh, with trees is what uh, is prescribed by, you know, the township landscape ordinance and there would be larger shade tree type trees along that frontage. So, so I mean, the township ordinance says if you remove a tree of that diameter, then you need to replace it with X number of trees of a much smaller diameter. It doesn't say a whole lot of that they need to grow to be, you know, the equivalent of a 20, that 25 inch diameter tree at, at some point in the future. So are you, you're saying effectively that that's not really in the plan right now? Uh, that you're keeping some existing trees, but the new trees are not going to grow to that stature? Uh, no, I think uh, they would grow to that stature. Uh, we, we just didn't feel that uh, a Norway spruce um, along the streetscape in that particular location was the best thing. Look, everybody's no, 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 interested. I, 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 I get it, right? Yeah, so yeah. so that, that tree's not in keeping with the design standards that you're looking for for the property. I get, I get the argument. And you know, part of the township's interest here is preserving trees that are going to enhance the canopy, have climate impacts, et cetera. So I'm effectively asking you, are you going to replace it with a tree that's gonna be long-lived enough and you know, large enough that will have a big canopy and will serve that effect while you know, being in keeping with the design aesthetic that you're looking for? I think the answer is yes. And are they identified on the plan? Uh, yes. 
Okay. Yes. Uh, so that was my question. Um, Jillian uh, or, or Chris and our question here, thank you very much. Um, uh, one of the things that we have when, when you know, in the previous plans is that um, uh, you know, applicants, uh, you know, when they were planting the street trees, they had to maintain them in perpetuity, right? So when we looked at the, the, the Bryn Mawr application, those street trees had to be maintained in perpetuity. Their, their, their plantings had to be maintained in perpetuity. Um, is there any such thing here? Because one of the, the questions that came in from a resident is, well, we've seen these things happen and then the existing trees die in three years, right? Is there, is there any sort of maintenance requirement? Um, I'm going to get a little finer into that, into your question. Um, the Bryn Mawr application was a commercial application. This is a residential application. Bryn Mawr, Bryn Mawr um, the Bryn Mawr application was on Lancaster Avenue. There is the purview of the Township Safety Commission, which is over township roadways. It has, per, um, and the township has a, has one of the few municipalities that actually has staff and has a Shade Commission. Um, and an arborist that maintains streets within the public right of way. So these trees that are shown within the public right of way would be maintained by the by the township because they're in the right of way. Um, the, and the one with the Bryn Mawr application, Lancaster Avenue isn't a township um, roadway, so we don't have that authority to maintain that. To pick up that hole, we require we put that back on the applicant. I'm not sure they realize that they're out of the room now, but they've now taken that responsibility on. Um, we usually include the requirements for maintaining landscaping in perpetuity on multifamily developments and commercial developments to make sure that that's taken care of. With private residents, we, we haven't put that as much because for the most part, private residents, people have a tendency of landscaping their own properties. You come out, you might change, and all of a sudden, well, I might have, I'm, you know, I, I now have two young boys, I need more open area and to require everybody to have a wooded lot when you might need some more open area to go throw a ball with your kids, we haven't gone that far um, with the landscaping. So that's why that condition is in it. Okay, so if I can follow up, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to digress too much tonight, but like we do require protection of the trees during construction. Oh, of right? course. We require fencing. Mm -hmm. um, so we require the process, but what you're telling me is our ordinances don't require a particular outcome. They don't require that the tree survive, only that you put a fence around it. Um, it's, it's a little, it's a little bit um, more than that. Okay. Uh, so during construction, the trees need to be maintained and, and um, the, the trees need to be protected. Um, the township has um, tree protection ordinances. That's the first thing that goes up when a construction project begins, and it's monitored. And it's something that we're, we are trying to work, and we are aware of as staff to work that through the construction process more. Sometimes that's one of that orange fencing you see also falls down. With the new landscaping that goes in. The landscaping is required to be put in, and in this case, it's maintained. The township doesn't have a mechanism to go inspect landscaping in any of these backyards of a, of a single family home. We just, okay. We're just not inspectors, it's not required okay. to that point. We're yeah, hoping that it's much answer. like anybody else in a residential neighborhood, you have good landscaping. We're giving them a good start. There's, this is actually with this, you know, have a good landscape architect, it's a well thought out plan. You, th you would assume that somebody would want to keep that landscaping. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that answer. Uh, we are still, believe it or not, discussing the, the motion. Um, uh, any other comments on that? Uh, looking on Zoom. Okay, so seeing none, I'm going to bring the, uh, a vote on the motion. So, uh, uh, Vice President Gavin, do you mind just repeating your, your the, the, the motion? The motion just is so to have amend it? condition number four. Yep. To say the applicant shall preserve the 25 inch spruce tree located along the frontage of law one. Okay, thank you, sir. All those in favor of that amendment, please raise your hand. Raise your hand. We have one, one two. A lot. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> Uh, abstentions. So, so that condition four is, is amended. Uh, okay, so now we are back to the the, you know, the the comments or rather questions about this existing uh, about this this subdivision plan. Uh, any other commissioners wish to ask questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'm going to open it to public comment. 
Can, oh, sorry. Yes. John. Sorry. Can I make one clarification? There seems to be an error with um, condition number ten. Okay. It reads: um, This condition was added at the Planning Commission in response to um, community concern that the um, about the curvature of the roadway and the location of the sidewalk. So there was a, a recommendation that that the trees along the frontage be shifted two feet back. Um, they're not located within the sightline triangles, but this was an additional two feet to provide a little bit of comfort for everyone there. So it, it would say the applicant shall shift, not preserve, the trees shown along lot two frontage two feet away from the street. Okay, thank you. Um, we, will, we will make that correct. Okay, so, so um, uh, I have some submitted a comment, but let's just see if people are here first. So, so Jody, is there anyone on Zoom for public comment? There is not. There is okay. actually no one on Zoom right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will not ask you anymore. Uh, anyone uh, in the room wish to make public comment on this? Uh, if you do, please just come up to this podium. Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, we do have some comments that have been submitted. Um, you know, rather than uh, you know, our, our normal practice when we have written submitted email comment, everyone on this board as well as staff has already seen these comments and so I'm not going to read them verbatim. Um, but Christopher and Beth Blum from Wynwood had concerns and questions relating to stormwater, to landscape and vegetation and to the construction management. David and Lisa Marcus, also from Wynwood, had some comments regarding the sidewalks, removal of shrubs and brush and stormwater. Jed Maslow from Windwood had concerns regarding the traffic and pedestrian safety and stormwater. And Shelby Simmons and Richard uh, Natow from Windwood had concerns regarding the floodplain, stormwater, and foliage. Uh, uh, and I'll note that, that many of the questions and concerns that they have raised had also come up in commissioner comment tonight. Uh, and, and hopefully they have been largely addressed. Um, with that, any last commissioner uh, comments? Commissioner Whalen. Yes, this is in my ward. Uh, I think that while we have all seen situations that we have been uh, displeased that a property has, you know, been purchased and subdivided and an existing home removed, uh, this is not one of those. I would urge everyone to support this. This is a single story. I actually walked the property with the builder. This is a very large rectangular lot uh, with a lot of street frontage. It's actually kind of an eyesore of a house, of an existing house in the neighborhood at the moment. Uh, it's a single story, relatively dilapidated property. Uh, probably been vacant at least a year, if I had to guess just by walking around. Uh, they're gonna be putting, the developer proposes two very nice homes that will be very much in line with this kind of very upscale community over there. Um, so I would urge that everyone supports this project. As amended. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, any other uh, comments? Okay, seeing none, um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, opposed? Okay. opposed? Um, okay. okay, Commissioner McKeon, McKeon opposed? Uh, any abstentions? Okay, um, okay. is it okay to put this on consent? Okay, thank you, sir. Um, so I think this takes us now back to agenda item, I guess it's number six, which is 3 Elmwood Avenue. Um, and that, uh, in my notes, is on page 77 of our packet. Hopefully I have that correct. And this is a preliminary land development plan for 3 Elmwood Avenue in Wynwood, Narberth. Uh, it, is, it is a split ownership, I guess, split zoning between two, two municipalities. Uh, and before I read this in, uh, I will turn it over to our Director of Building and Planning, Chris Lesway. Um, Commissioner Sino, this is an unusual application that it's in two municipalities, and it's also unusual that it's in two municipalities being heard at the same time. Mm -hmm. Currently, the applicant is before the Narbro, uh, Narberth um, Borough Council. Uh, they cannot be here. They were hoping to come here after that decision was made. What I would suggest is um, we can find out where they are in their process and deliberation if they're in, in route. We would need five minutes, but there's another item for the reappointment of the Planning Commission. Perhaps the um, BMP can move to that yep, item. Happy, happy and then to take do a that. Recess next, for 10 minutes. 
We can all say glowing things about Mr. France and drag it out for a while. Um, <laughs> we, uh, if I may, I yeah, think it's got from Arbor stories. Council that it was denied in Arbor. Okay, so so yeah. we, we still need to hear this I'm thing. Sorry, we're waiting for the, the applicant. President Bernheim, I, I couldn't hear anything that you said, so. No. Well, I said I, I just heard from Arbor that it was denied. The application in Arbor was denied. The, the Elmwood Road project. Correct. Okay. So, so we are going to turn to item number eight, which is a reappointment to the Planning Commission. Um, and uh, because, because your staff will, will tell us, but I believe we probably still have to hear item number six. Um, and so uh, uh, I will move that we consider for recommend, that we recommend to the Board of Commissioners the retroactive reappointment of Scott France to an additional four year term on the Planning Commission to expire July 2025. Do I have a second? second? I've got lots of seconds. Um, so uh, uh, I guess I'm not sure there's any um, uh, staff here. Does uh, anyone have comment on this? Uh, Commissioner Whalen. Uh, I would very strongly support and recommend Scott France. I think we are very, very lucky to have him on there. Uh, I will note that I, when I co-chaired the Planning Commission not too long ago before coming on this uh, board, um, I very much prompted Scott to try to take over as one of the co-chairs when I was leaving, uh, which I was very happy that he did, and I would very strongly recommend that we vote him as long as he wants to stay. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Whalen. Uh, Commissioner Zello. And it's worth noting that Scott France is not only on the Montgomery County Planning Commission staff, he's in charge. So he is a Planning Commission member in Lower Marin who brings extraordinary experience and capability. Thank you, Commissioner Zello. Uh, any other commissioners? Uh, I, I will add that, that as a frequent observer of the Planning Commission, I, I probably can't, I don't have as deep of, of, of a, a knowledge of Scott France as, as Commissioner Whalen does, but he never fails to impress me with his thoughtful comments and his uh, you know, incredible manner in, in running that board. He does a really terrific job, and we are extremely fortunate to have him. Uh, so with that, all those in favor of the reappointment to Scott France, please raise your hand. I forgot to get public comment. Any public, any public comment on this? Okay. Okay. So, so, so raise hand. your hand. Okay. Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. The ayes have it. So, may we now go back to agenda item number six? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I ask for a point of clarification? You may. Um, being that the president uh, mentioned that um, this was was denied in another municipality. Is this even feasible for us to move forward with this discussion tonight? Well, we are, we are going to hear from staff about that, but my understanding is no, that we are going to have to hear this tonight. And you know, this does come before two different, it's a, it's a fair question, it comes before two different municipalities independently with two different independent purviews, and you know, I think our process is we have to hear it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. May I make an attempt at a motion? Good. And pass a vote before we hear this. Uh, so, so if I can defer that to me to hear a little bit about what we have to do in timing, if that's okay, and then I'll come to you. Well, if I may, also as a point, a point of order that um, if the applicants uh, willing to bypass this this evening in light of the unanimous vote in Norberth. Um, to the extent that they have a dispute how governing bodies are ruling on this, that may be the place that they want to uh, focus on since the overwhelming majority of land is in Narber. I don't know, do we have somebody here for the applicant? They are here. May I have a few minutes to consult with them? Yeah, yes, I, I, do. Think I think that'd think be an can, excellent I idea. We can recess for a couple yeah. minutes here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Because I believe their attorney is en route and depending upon traffic between Norbert and here, she should be here shortly. Very good. So Tiffany raises a, a point which is I'm not sure if we've gone to we're still up here. Okay, so live. Yeah. Did the other committee? Yeah, we're we're, we're yeah, not. So we don't go to commercial break. Yeah. We're, right, so we're okay. still here. So careful. Who said it? Exactly. Sorry. Do you have my uh, stuff for the announcement for the Heritage yeah, Association right. tonight? Yeah. 
17 cents of recycling. Okay, everyone. Uh, we, we are going to start back. Okay, we are going to start back up again. Thank you. In my, in my, in my good sons of class careful. voice. <laughs> We are resuming the business of the Building and Planning Committee at this point, point. Uh, and the agenda, uh, agenda item in front of us is a preliminary land development plan uh, for 3 Elmwood Avenue in uh, Wynwood and Arberth. Um, and I guess at this point, uh, I will turn this over to our Director of Building and Planning, Chris Leswing, for giving us a, uh, an update on where, where, you know, where things stand with us. Uh, we've had conversations with the applicant and they've um, we've suggested and they've accepted that we're going to table this applicant. The applicant would like to table this for 30 days to better understand the decision from Norbert Borough and um, and how to how best to proceed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And and do we do we vote on that or they just have put it in and that just happens? It's it's ever, I mean, it would be something that the board should acknowledge if that's where you want to go, but it's really the applicant's decision to grant you that extension. Okay, so, so this has been tabled for 30 days, or for 30 day Correct. continuance, I guess, by the applicant. Um, and, uh, Mr. Fromholtz, I think. Okay, Mr. Fromholtz, please. please. Uh, uh, thank you, a few Commissioner minutes. Sinai. Just so uh, we're on the record as uh, agreeing to that, uh, uh, we do agree to that 30 day extension. We uh, appreciate that, and uh, I think as has been said, that'll give us an opportunity to better understand uh, what Norberth, uh, uh, w w what the significance of their action tonight is and, and uh, w whether uh, uh, it, this turns into any different type of extension, but at least it's uh, good for 30 days out. And I thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I, I appreciate make, the, the, the thoughtfulness that went into that choice. And uh, we just make a, we complete that is without prejudice so that you and your client understand that, Mr. Yeah, that's right. So, so I, um, with that, um, I believe that concludes the business of the Building and Planning Committee for this evening, President Bernheim. Well, thank you very much. That, that was absolutely uh, excellent. A uh, lot, lot of items that, that were there. Um, you know, and with that, I, I will note a couple things before we adjourn. <laughs> Phillies three, the four. lousy book. Oh, I was four, just told four. four, four to two uh, over the Baltimore Orioles. Don't get excited. They've lost 102 games this year. And with that, that concludes the business <laughs> that for is the Orioles, uh, not the Phillies. I'm sorry. Announcements. Oh, were there any announcements? My apologies. Anybody have anything? Uh, Commissioner O'Neill. I have a. I, we should. We might have a slide or two to go along with this announcement. Um, this is for this Saturday. Um, Bryn Mawr is going to be the home to the Harrison. Uh, And at 10 to 4 is going to be uh, really bringing colonialism to life. I encourage everybody to come. It's going to be a great time, rain or shine, and um, hopefully we'll see you there. Excellent. Thank you very much. And Commissioner Grimes. Yes, um, we also should have a slide um, for what I'm going to talk about. Um, for those who have been severely impacted by the hurricane uh, that we had a few weeks ago, anywhere, oh, here it is, anywhere in the township, there are federal, state, and state and county resources to help you uh, re rebuild and recover. As you can see on the slide, FEMA has a uh, website, disasterassistance.gov, which has a guide to applying for FEMA grants. Uh, the U.S. Small Business Association uh, uh, has loans for businesses, homeowners, and renters. And Montgomery County has opened a disaster recovery center in Norristown with recovery specialists from several government agencies who are available to talk to uh, homeowners, residents, and business owners. So please take care of these resources, uh, take advantage of these resources that will be available for a limited time. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Grimes. I know you, you've been doing a, a lot to educate people of all, all that's out there. It's really appreciated. <clears throat> so I was just checking with any of our colleagues on Zoom to make sure we don't ask them if they've got any other announcements other than it other than some grins and some shake of heads of no all right 
So with that, that then concludes the business uh, for the Board of Commissioners this evening. I thank you all for your hard work and have a good night. We are adjourned.